Good morning. Good morning, uh, Good morning. Uh, yeah. committee and, and our guests. Uh, it's Wednesday, February 1st. Uh, starting in February, all awful nights at below zero. Uh, very encouraging. Um, and uh, so this morning, um, we're fortunate to have uh, representatives from the congressional delegation with us, and, uh, and they so they can meet us, and we can meet them, and, and uh, it, uh, it's always been a pleasure working with our federal uh, delegation over the years, and uh, but we got a different. Well, we got a little different crew, but some different stocks. So um, it's great to have you folks with us this morning. And we'll, uh, morning. we'll uh, start off uh, this morning uh, by introducing ourselves, and then we'll have you folks introduce yourselves and go from there. So. Brian Collimore representing the Rutland District. Irene Runner, Chittenden North, including Fairfax. Brian Campion, Bennington County, Wilmington. I'm Rich Weston, Lamp. And Bobby Starr up in Orleans County and four towns in Caledonia County. So, <clears throat> uh, so welcome. And uh, the uh, I don't know if there's any particular order. Um, that we'll run in, but I would expect we'll start with Will uh, representing our most senior uh, senator in, in Washington. And, uh, and it's just a, a give and take type uh, meeting, our committee meeting to get to uh, put a face with the names and, and uh, so, uh, Will, I don't know if you want to sit sure. right up to the table. Might as well. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. Thank yeah. Good morning and, and welcome. Well, thank you. It was uh, five when I left this morning and minus five in Moncton, and it got a little bit warmer in Montpelier, so I'm quick to ride. Uh, it's heating up. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're hopeful. <laughs> It'll cross the 20 degree mark by noon, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so my name's Will Stevens. Uh, I'm an outreach representative for Senator Sanders. Um, I've been with a senator for about just over a year now, and um, as outreach representative, I, I cover uh, uh, agriculture, forestry, uh, small business, economic development, workforce development, uh, hunger and nutrition issues, and now pensions as well. So I'll get into that in a second. Um, yeah, so uh, as I said, I live in Shoreham. Uh, my wife and I ran a commercial organic vegetable farm for 40 years, um, and we're now in the, in the process of transitioning that over to our daughter. Um, and she had, took it on last year uh, for her first year, which freed me up to do something different. And that's essentially how I landed in this job with the senator. Um, I was also, for those who don't know, I was also in the legislature from uh, 2007 to 2014, representing the towns of Shoreham, Orwell, Whiting, and Benson. You've been doing that long. Oh, macro. Time flies. <laughs> Time flies. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. macro. <laughs> so, there are days I miss it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, so, um, yeah, so I guess the big news um, uh, from our office is that the senator has moved from chairing the budget committee to chairing the health, education, labor, and pensions committee, um, which he's very excited about. And um, he, uh, 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 after they were sworn in at the beginning of January, they then went on recess, and so they've only been back in session for a couple weeks. So they're really just kind of getting the, the chairs moved around and organized and so forth, and now they're, they're getting down to business. Um, as you can imagine, he's, he's uh, looking forward to um, fighting big pharma, advocating for minimum wage, and uh, uh, better access to primary health care, among many other things, using, using that chairmanship of that committee to, to 
advocate for many of his pet causes. Um, what, what does the health committee do? Um, health, it, it, it oversees the Department of Health and Human Services, um, the FDA, and, and all those related things. Um, education, uh, jurisdiction over uh, issues related to education, workforce development, things like that. Labor, most federal labor and employment laws and pension, um, private retirement plans, and uh, railroad retirement, and other types of things. And I ended up uh, covering pension because um, there was no one else uh, on the outreach team that was going to do it. And so um, because uh, we have exposure on the health committee, we needed a, a pension person uh, on the outreach. And, and the way Senator Sanders organizes his office is um, he has teams of, he has a, a six person outreach team. <clears throat> and our job is to uh, be his eyes and ears in the community and the issue areas that we cover. He also has a casework team, which is separate from that. So the outreach team does a little bit of casework, very little bit, but, um, but mostly we're, we're meant to be going around the state, um, listening and talking to Vermonters to see what's important. Yeah. So, um, so uh, he also, uh, Senator Sanders also continues to serve on the budget, Veterans Affairs, Energy and Natural Resources, and the Environment and Public Works Committees. He's been on those um, right along and continues there. Um, he continues, he will continue to work in support of Vermont's family farms, diversified agriculture, um, and nutritious, access to nutritious food for all Vermonters, of course. Um, and climate change, as many of you know, uh, he's called an existential threat. So he's looking for ways to address that um, as well. Um, the farm bill's coming up. I'll, I'll defer to Ryan on some of that. We, in our shop, have, have begun, um, we did a couple listening sessions last November to start um, kind of kicking, kicking off our efforts in terms of um, bringing the center up to speed of issues of importance uh, uh, in the 12 titles of the farm bill. Um, and uh, also I want to mention um, two things. One, um, CDSs are earmarks. We're not sure if they're going to be back for, 20, uh, for fiscal year 24. Um, uh, we're still waiting for that. Uh, I, I do want to mention a couple of, of earmark projects that our office is involved with that are relevant to this committee. One is an agroforestry, agroforestry product uh, project that Megan Giroux from the Interlace Commons is, is working on with a number of farms around the state to implement uh, agroforestry practices on farms and another one is um for the fiscal year 23 uh, has to do with the Center for Ag Economy Farm Connects program, uh, their distribution delivery system that helps integrate um, food hubs and farms and markets. So, um, you know, we, we support that with a CDS and, and uh, John Ramsey up there is doing great work. Um, we had John in last week and I'm telling you, it's quite a, a combination of many things that yeah. that they do. Absolutely. Distributing to picking up, uh, yeah. packaging and process. I mean, it, it's really wild. Yeah, and it's supposed to be profitable. I mean, it's in a, about a year's time, I think he told us. And so this year, Mark's going to help him. Yeah. on that path. Another thing I want to bring up, um, and again, um, uh, we can talk about it more later, but I just want to kind of get it on the table, is um, we were invited down to a USDA event sponsored by Senator Welch down at the Coors Farm um, the other day uh, to talk about uh, the USDA's rollout of um, the strengthening organic enforcement rule and the organic dairy uh, marketing uh, program to help organic uh, dairy farmers. Um, in the lead up to that, last year uh, I, I contacted, I was in touch with probably uh, about a quarter of Vermont's organic dairies um, to hear their stories and to find out um, what their ask might be if they had the opportunity to, if we had the opportunity, let's say, to come up with some emergency relief funds in the last year's omnibus bill. And um, that didn't happen. Uh, but uh, what the number, the number I heard was between six and eight dollars a hundred to be made whole in, for 2022 um, was what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. Depended on the operation, the debt load and practices and management and all that stuff. But the average seemed to be about six to eight dollars per hundred weight. Uh, they were that much shy of needing to break even. So um, again, I, I don't want to steal Ryan's thunder, but the, um, the organic dairy uh, proposal that came through the USDA, through the CCC, uh, found, is coming up with about $100 million to address that, which by my back the envelope calculations comes out to, in the best case scenario, maybe $2, 100 Nationwide yep. for the organic? Under 5 million pounds for, for the organic dairy. So I did get cat dealt then. 
Yeah, was there any talk about fixing the issue of why they're running so far behind on um, per hundred weight basis and trying to resolve uh, that problem? Um, th not addressed through this proposal. Um, but it's definitely on our screen. Uh, it's it's and I, I'm not, I, I want to. I'm happy to talk about that, but I also want to give equal time to other. And maybe we could all yeah. be part of that. Yeah, we appropriate. Can do, so. uh, do a round room. Sure. Discussion. Yeah, but I'd love to pick that conversation up. Yeah. So. Yeah. Any questions for Will? Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ryan. <coughs> Thank you, Bill. Hello, Sandy. How are you? Good. 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 I'm great. Um, for the record, I'm Ryan McLaren. I'm a senior advisor to now Senator Welch. Um, and I've been doing the ag portfolio for the whole time I've been with him. So, better part of eight years. I'm the old guy in the bunch, I guess, at this point, now that Tom Barry's moved on. Hi, Tom. Um, anyway, so uh, Peter sworn in as our junior senator January 3rd, and uh, we've sort of hit the ground running. Uh, we finally got our committee assignments last week. Um, Peter will be appointed to the Agriculture Committee, which is a really um, he's really excited about, I'm really excited about selfishly, gets to do a lot of good work with Vermont farmers still. Um, and uh, he'll also be on uh, the Commerce Committee, which has a lot of jurisdiction over, has a, a wide ranging jurisdiction over intellectual property, a lot of transportation issues. Um, he'll be on Judiciary, the Judiciary Committee, and he'll be on the Rules Committee. So. I think agriculture is probably chief among uh, the interests for you all. And uh, as Will suggested, we have a farm bill reauthorization that's coming up this year. Um, it's 12 titles of the farm bill that cover uh, many, many, many things. Um, and I'm sort of happy to go into those in more detail if that's useful for you all. Um, if not, then stop me. But the biggest, um, chunk of money in the farm bill is the nutrition program, so SNAP benefits, um, something that uh, obviously as the pandemic winds down is a topic of conversation here. Um, and uh, we have wonderful service providers in Vermont that are doing excellent work on making sure people don't go hungry. Um, and it's we partner closely with them to make sure that what works uh, in Vermont is allowable, essentially, uh, through these federal programs that can be somewhat inflexible. So uh, we'll hopefully be able to do some good work there. Uh, the commodities um, program, Title of Title One, is commodities, it's dairy, essentially, and for Vermonters, dairy is the big one, but it also covers soy, rice. Peanuts. Any, any discussion on uh, universal meals for our schools? That Senator Lady or Senator Sanders, excuse me, is uh, lead sponsor of a universal school meals bill. Peter was a co-sponsor in the House. I don't know if there's one if it's been re up this this Congress, but um, it will. Be. I'm sure it will be, and and so there will be a discussion about it. We'll talk about that then in general. Yeah. Um, Conservation through NRCS uh, will be another deep conversation um, and one of Peter's priorities. How do we use the Farm Bill and our farmers who are stewards of land to um, address climate change and to ensure that farmers are rewarded for the good work that they do to preserve our climate and preserve our land, preserve the soil. Um, trade is Title Three. it's another important title. Uh, particularly for our dairy industry, where a number of a, a good proportion of what we are producing, um, the milk we're producing is getting exported. Uh, nutrition, I mentioned. Uh, credit, so farm the farm credit programs is Title V, Title VI is rural development. Um, so USDA rural development, if you is uh, an important partner for us and a lot of communities across the state in terms of grant funding or. Um, 
low interest loans. They also have housing, low interest housing um, mortgages uh, in rural communities. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, actually, the new uh, school in Winooski was funded in, in large part through USDA Rural Development. Um, and uh, they took good advantage of those programs. Um, research and extension, so UVM Extension is uh, funded through Title VII, um, and they do incredible work. I'm sure you will hear from them over and over again. <laughs> uh, but, you know, are constantly in need of uh, support for the research that they're doing. And um, a lot of the more innovative things that are happening in Vermont yeah. agriculture are a result of like research projects that um, Heather Darby's doing, or they just provide uh, a like bottomless resource for Vermont farmers. Uh, we had the director of the extension service in yeah. a week or two ago, and uh, it seems like they're right on top of things. They really are. Their research and outreach and a lot with Maple. Yep. Uh, so they're they're doing well. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, um, I th the Maple Research Center is funded through extension, but they also it's also funded through, I think, uh, horticulture grants through the ACER Access Grant Program. So a lot of federal funding has gone into supporting that program. It's kind of unique and one of a kind in the United States. The, the only one we had problems with is uh, the Morgan question. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, we're trying to double their appropriations from the state from one dollar to two. two. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, I mean, he gave a good report on, you know, what's going on there. Yeah. But I don't know if they run with federal money or just money from the university. Uh, we give them right. very, very, well, none, really. We just keep that line open. Right. Um, I'm not sure exactly how much federal funding they would yeah. get. Um, uh, Title Eight is forestry, so uh, an obviously an important industry here in Vermont. Uh, nine is energy, which encourages the development of farm community and renewable energy. Um, horticulture, I mentioned, that's where all the organic programs are housed, especially crop block grants, which are sort of small um, niche producers have used, um, things like saffron. We have a saffron conference, and a lot of that industry is supported that way. Um, Title 11 is crop insurance, and then uh, there's a miscellaneous Title 12. So that's just the big picture overview. It's a giant omnibus package, um, theoretically reauthorized every five years, and um, Peter's excited to be able to dig in. Yeah. You know, the way Senator Leahy was able to. No one can replace Senator Leahy, but it's great for Vermont farmers that we have a voice on that committee. Yeah. I think. Um, so his big priorities for the farm bill are going to be dairy. Um, we've had some success uh, in the conventional market, um, both in they're, they're getting a good price at this moment and the um, dairy margin coverage program, the margin, you know, insurance program that USD created in 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, we worked out the tweaks to a certain degree <laughs> and uh, it seems to be functioning relatively well for folks. There's still some there are more tweaks to be made, but it feels like yeah. the industry is not interested in scrapping the entire program, uh, which is great. At, there was a time <laughs> when it went by a different name that it was uh, thought to be hopelessly used, they're useless <laughs> essentially. And uh, we've do, done a lot of good work to make sure that the, the margins are right and the price, like what the price point for the insurance is right, that it actually makes a difference for farmers. We, uh, as you know, I, I would presume that we, we last year we picked up the insurance premium for our local guys, mm -hmm. and um, and we're working on doing the same thing this year. Uh, the uh, the big issue with 
the DMC program, and it works great. Yeah. But the issue is that we've got that 139 farmers uh, organic that that aren't in the, right. really in the mix. And, right. And that's why you know they're losing so much money. Uh, but we did, you know, we did um, found a few million dollars even this last year came into the state, but the year before that, I think mean, 55, 60 million dollars that was paid to our uh, farmers. So yeah. it, it really well, made the difference where they could keep going or come down here and try to get money out of us. Right. So it, it works good as a national. Right. Yeah, I think folks would prefer not to need it, you know? They'd well, rather be in a yeah. situation they are now or their the margin on their milk is good enough where they're making money and they can support themselves and, and the yeah. business. But yeah, last year's a good example. And you, when it, we needed it, it actually Work. helps. And so, but your, to your point about organic, that's number two priority. And this is not in any particular order, but the second one I want to touch on is the organic program. Yeah. The Peterson will have his first ag committee hearing today, and um, Secretary Moffitt, who came up to um, the uh, Coors Farm last Friday, uh, will be testifying. And this is a conversation they had last week. It's a conversation. It's something he's planning on asking her about today to see, just to keep pressing on the fact that we don't have an insurance program for organic dairy. We've never really needed one. And we're in, we're in a sort of unprecedented time when the market conditions that have impacted conventional for so long is is hitting the organic market. So um, it's something we'll keep having a conversation about um, and pushing on and yeah. as we move forward for the farm bill. And then the other part of organics is just like program integrity. You know, the organic program was started by Senator Leahy. It was in Vermont organic farmers, you know, were is sort of the like backbone of what that program became. When people buy organic products in the supermarket, they like see the course farm. That's what they envision. And the market isn't that anymore. And so it's it's um, there's been a lot of damage to the brand of organic and to the usefulness of the certification um, through the like lacks program integrity, frankly, from the National Organic Program. So uh, Peter's been doing this for a long time, but ensuring that when people that buy an organic product, the image they have in their head matches reality, that it's like a farm that is like family run, it stewards of the land, and isn't just there to make a buck. And um, that's something you know, they're, they're trading off the backs of like Vermont organic farmers that built the program and and created that entire brand. So the brand integrity of organic is is important. Um, and so we'll we'll keep working with Secretary Moffitt and on these new enforcement rules. It's the biggest overhaul on ever. And, yeah, to make sure that they do hold people accountable, but don't make it so burdensome that a small like mixed vegetable farm in Vermont can't meet their their requirements it's just like a, a, a bureaucratic burden mm -hmm. so there's a balancing act there but um, I think Peter will uh, you know, do well on the Ag Committee uh, he way back he helped uh, when he was here in the Senate I made quite a few trips with me to uh, through the dairy compact. Yeah. And so he under certainly understands the issue right. and the problems. And, yeah. Right. Yeah, those were the days. <laughs> yeah. uh, back in the dairy compact days. Brian. Uh, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Uh, Regenerative soils, is that coming up at all? I know this committee's talked a little bit about regenerative soils over the years yeah, well, and, you know, yes, yeah, sequestering carbon. Yeah. Huge, huge opportunities there. I know you touched on it a little bit early on, just yeah. how, 
how do we reward farmers in part yeah. for doing this good work? Yeah. Is there a bill or anything that's happening? Well, the farm bill will be a huge vehicle. I mean, so much of what we can pay, like they, we give out a ton of money through NRCS for, for promoting specific practices. Okay. And so that you, you both are sort of like keep leading me into my next point. But climate change is, is address, using the farm bill to address climate change through whether you call it payment for ecosystem services. I know there's a working group in Vermont that's happening right now, but it would be a huge missed opportunity to not help what our climate goals through the farm bill because there's so much money going out the door to people doing work on the ground. And so it'll be a, it'll be a uh, puzzle to figure out how best to do that. And some of it might just be allowing some flexibility within like the conservation programs. Um, NRCS does amazing work and, and sometimes that work is like constrained by the, the sort of conventional thinking of USDA. And so allowing folks in Vermont to um, use those dollars to like, to, to meet those goals yeah. is a different way of thinking than it has been in the past. It's mm -hmm. been like, purely runoff based or, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. so it's a different metric, but it's an important one for Peter as we build these programs. In the Vermont, the required ag practice, yeah. that incorporates all these projects and programs that NRCS promotes. And uh, if you don't meet uh, the required ag practices, it's because you aren't following what uh, the, you know, the NRCS is promoting and, and doing. And, um, soil, soil health, regenerative yeah. ag and, and soil health is a big issue with them. And I don't think we've had NRCS in yet, but we, we will get okay. them in yeah, once great. we get our bearings. So. Yeah. Um, Cause you can do it. If it, Leon at the course farm hasn't plowed his field in yeah, 40 years. Yeah, there's some guys wow. um, Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and they're the successful. In, the Somebody. field in back of my house, or the field that my house is built on, that hasn't been plowed in 50 years or more, and it wasn't because uh, it uh, it needed plowing or it didn't need plowing because if you turn a sod over there you go up through once with the plow you're two days picking the stone <laughs> <laughs> so so it's pretty important to keep that real healthy and <laughs> right. well um yeah we put corn there once and that was a, it was a busy summer <laughs> um and then I'll just wrap up quickly because I'm taking too much of your time. But um, the last two priorities that Peter's talked about are the nutrition programs that are essential to Vermonters, um, and essential, like like I said, the most expensive portion of the entire farm bill, um, and uh, farm to school, the farm to school programs that Peter and Senator Lee have worked hard on for a long time, and. Um, you know, we've been really successful. Peter was up in um, at the St. Albans City School, and we had lunch there, and it, it's incredible the work they do with the meals they make. Uh, it's yeah. different than my old school lunch, and uh, yeah. it's uh, there's a lot more we can do to make food service providers' lives easier, and the connection between farmers and in those uh, institutions um, more seamless. There's a lot of rules. Um, and that's all, so that's the farm bill and Peter's priorities. I will caution, like, last time we did this, we, you know, we, it, it became, instead of a five-year farm bill, it became a seven-and-a-half-year farm bill. It, we reauthorized it, a, like, short-term a few times, and that's very possible. So none of these things are, like, necessarily overnight. Maybe, you never know. We might, we might, lightning might strike and we can get something done by the deadline of this farm bill, but there are, there's, there's, you know, plenty of possibilities for it to be, these changes to be, uh, to come into effect a year 
two years down the line as we work to put this new Congress together and actually get the work done. So it's really a TBD I, at the, on the timeline. Um, we'll have to do something this year, whether it's just reauthorizing what we're doing now until we find a different, until we write a different bill. Uh, I don't know. Does that, does that what, like, could be getting a new bill or? I don't know the answer to that. That's kind of, it's like, no, right. it's too soon to tell, I guess. I'll have more, I'll have a better feeling for it than yeah, Peter will sure. as, as we start getting into the work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there other New England senators on the Act Committee? Um, that's a really good question. I'll have to go back and look. It's new to me as well, so I'm not sure. I think I don't think so. I think at least there weren't, and um, which is why half the reason why not. There's Jill Brand, Jill Brand, and Booker, and Fetterman. Yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah, she she's good to work, don't you? Yeah. That's fine. No problem. Thank you. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. Welcome. very much. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, for the record, David Chair, State Director for Representative Becca Ballant. And um, some of you have seen me around the building in other capacities in the past, as uh, some of you know, I the Attorney General's office for a number of years. and was just at the Cannabis Control Board for a couple of years, and now I'm working for the Congresswoman, great. which has been great. We're, our office is very much still in startup mode. The U.S. House gave us working computers last week. So <laughs> we are, wow. we're doing the best we can, but- um, Now it'll be all downhill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's quite true. Um, <laughs> being reachable is a challenge, but uh, the, it, you know, the, so that's a little bit about, about my background, and, and we are still getting up to speed. The folks who are, I, and to be perfectly transparent, as some of you know, agriculture is not my area of expertise, so I apologize that we weren't able to bring the folks here uh, due to some conflicts, um, personal conflicts they had. So, but I did want to say a couple things, and the folks who I'm here with are far more expert than I am, so I want to leave most of the time for them to be able to talk with you. Um, but a couple things to note, some of which I think is is, is obvious, which is that you know the um, party is in a different position in the House than in the U.S. House than it is in the U.S. Senate, and so uh, the representative is really thinking about some of the areas where she's going to have to play defense on some key issues, and I think some of the things they've identified as being areas of concern for them, uh, areas that are most likely to be attacked, if you will are the nutrition benefits, which is a huge area of the bill, the SNAP benefits, they are expecting the attempts to cut those significantly in the House, um, and some of the rural development money. They're also concerned about, although they're a little more hopeful that there's, um, they're hopeful that they can defend both, but I'd say on the rural development money, it's a little uh, easier to find alliances across the aisle because there's so many folks on the other side of the aisle who, who share some real strong interests in protecting that money. Um, and the SNAP benefits are a bit, tend to be a bit more of a political football. Um, but that, so that are two, those are two areas that the Congresswoman's Office has identified as areas they're going to need to focus on, not because the other areas of the Farm Bill aren't important, but because they recognize the position they're in. Yeah. And uh, we'll certainly work with the senators from Vermont. They, I think, will be much in much better positions to do really affirmative, forward-looking policy. And um, Congresswoman Ballant will be in a position to try to defend what they do in the House and put <clears throat> some defense on those other key areas. Well, she's got years of catching up to do. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> Seniority wise, she's got it. Yeah. And, uh, Peter have been there a long time. They, they really have. And, uh, you know, people say, well, she can't do it. we, we <laughs> should have awesome. term limits and, and all that good stuff, but it kind of pays to have a little seniority at times. And, it certainly does. But, uh, of course, we, well, Irene didn't work with Becca much, uh, just maybe, uh, but the rest of us worked uh, a lot with Becca and uh, really good, uh, did a long way and quick study and just a 
all around good, good person. And, and that, that means quite a bit when you're dealing with uh, you're in the minority and you've got to deal with the majority to have an attitude uh, like she has to make that all, all blend together. I appreciate that, Senator, and I think that's right, and I think she's already working to build some of those relationships and following the examples of our, our prior to Congress people who are represented here yeah. as well, uh, well <laughs> and, uh, and how they were, exactly, and they, they found different ways to be effective, and she's studying a bit of their example, too, and, and how she can figure out uh, ways to be effective uh, in, the, in the House, and, uh, and I think you're exactly right. She's, she's got a natural skill for building those relationships, and she's yeah. already doing that. Yeah, I know in the Senate, uh, well, I have two minority members in here, but I always felt that you folks in the minority party were treated really no different no, than those of us in the majority party. And, you know, it, yeah, politics is, it's, uh, it's strange sometimes. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I came in together down there uh, as senators. As a, as a matter of fact, you did too, Brian. We were the three new guys, gals, that year. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think it's a testament to yeah. her personality that true. She rose very quickly here, and uh, yeah. she, it won't take her long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know what he's saying. We expect I, I, hear, <laughs> I, I, I hear the subtext, too. Like, <laughs> she's going to work hard. I know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, other questions or comments? Um, well, why don't we open it up to, to everyone and we'll just have a, a little round the room discussion. Could I pick up where Senator Campion kind of was leading with a reject? I can never pronounce the word. Did he yeah. come up with another term? So regenerative agriculture? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just at a meeting last night of the uh, Champlain Valley Farmers Coalition down in Middlebury. And um, uh, Travis Thomason was there, the new um, state director for the Soil Conservation Service, or excuse me, NRCS. And um, he mentioned that, he mentioned the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which put a lot of money into conservation programs and different things, $20 billion and over 10 years. And um, he mentioned to the folks last night that what that means for Vermont is uh, an, incre an annual increase from about 12 million a year to uh, 32 to 42 million. He figured 20 to 30 additional million dollars are going to come to Vermont because of the IRA. So you can get them in here to tell yourself, but that's, that's great. Those are the notes that I made for NRCS. Thanks, yeah, That's great. And we, over the last maybe four, six years, we worked on quite a lot on regenerative ag and, and trying to build, you know, get our guys, to, our farmers to build better soils and and uh, you know, if you do that, you use less commercial fertilizer, you retain the water in the soils, uh, grow better crops. And, and I, I think, you know, they're catching on. Um, we're injecting a lot of fields uh, with manure, injecting it right into the soils and uh, yeah, Red Shaffet, he's a big, uh, large LFO up north. Um, he, he was showing me his agronomist report, and I think he, it was just about 50% reduction in commercial fertilizer uh, on these fields that he's been working for the last five years with injections and um, and uh, getting the manure on at the right time, and no, it's work. It's working, um, and I, you know, our our big guys are all into that. And what we what we're doing is trying to help our uh, districts own injectors, manure injectors, so they can let different farmers use the same. Uh, piece of equipment, but because you run out of time that way. 
All right. So I don't know if they have a program that helps uh, uh, these uh, water districts uh, like Shanghai Valley. I think they may have a. Do they have a manure injector? Or do they talk about that? Are you talking that? about the, the watershed coalition groups or the yeah. conservation districts? No, the conservation districts. I know some of them do have. Yeah. But I don't yeah. know about the watershed. Yeah, I'm not sure about the Champlain Valley folks, if they do or not, but they'd love to come off and tell you. So I'm yeah. sure if they haven't heard from them yet. It, it seems to be making a, a vast difference. <laughs> um, Okay, you better get on to your meals program. That's right, that's right, that's right. Want me to say a word about that? Yeah. So, uh, Senator Starr, uh, this committee, and how in Senate Ed, Ed have been working on universal school meals. You may know we extended it one year last year. We've had a lot of testimony uh, in this committee and in education around what a huge difference it's making. You're getting a couple things happening. You're getting fewer kids going to the nurse's office because of belly aches because they haven't eaten. Getting more community gatherings in the lunchroom, cafeterias every morning and afternoon. So social, socializing, things like that. You're getting a lot more healthy foods. I mean, I think upwards to a million dollars was spent on local farms because of this. And we hope that that's just gonna continue to increase. I think I'm more than confident in five years we could see you know schools in this state saying 80 90 percent of our our food is you know locally sourced and uh so you know our hope is to extend this you know going forward it, it's a it's not a huge ticket item but it's a big ticket item i mean we're talking you know roughly 20 million dollars and, and then some but as i think we're all hearing the stigma is so tough in schools. I mean, we heard this in, I chair Senate Ed in the afternoon. Yesterday it was just reinforced. And unless you go to universal meals, that stigma is not going to break down. I mean, the stories themselves, you know, the, the stomach aches for one, the kids that uh, when you don't, in some schools, we heard, I think the, what was said was in some schools, I, hopefully this isn't Vermont, but if you have meal debt, you don't get the same kind of meal as other kids. Uh, you know, tough chasing parents down, looking for money, heartbreaking. I, you know, this is the United States of America. You get, you know, and some of the argument is, well, you know, and, and you know, wealthier kids can pay, but we don't make wealthy kids pay for their history textbooks. You know, we basically say this is the school day. You're going to get your lab equipment free, your textbooks for free. You're going to commit. And we want to move toward, you know, making this program permanent. And uh, so I'm optimistic. You know, uh, one thing, you know, Bobby has always taught us is, you know, be able to count to 16. Uh, that's what we're going to carve on his tombstone. Uh, <laughs> Although it'll probably help give us all. And you can do that when you're going to post. So it shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I, I'm optimistic we're going to be able to, to do this, but you should just you know be aware that uh, that this is on our radar and it's it's really important and we're hearing it's making <laughs> frankly i think i've been shocked by what a big difference it's oh, making it's in sick. the schools when we have you know people who are feeding kids every day talk to us so yeah what would really work well if the if the feds um, put through a uh, in the nutrition program school nutrition if they would put through a match, even a matching fund, uh, you know, so that if they couldn't do it all, which is you know nationwide, that's very expensive. But it, it would be a, some type of a voluntary program that if your state wants to do a uh, free universal meals, they pay half, or and then get the state or the, even the local district to do that. But it, it's really, it's really important 
and I don't think we're any different uh, socially, our state, than uh, most states uh, about feeding their children. Uh, you know, they come to school hungry all over the country, not just in Vermont. And in the other issue, you know, we talk about the environment. And, and not, well, we're, as a society, we're better off to grow that food locally than, and I'm a, by profession, I was always a truck, a truck person. And, uh, you know, it, it's crazy to run a truck from the West Coast to the East Coast with a load of veggies on it. Yeah. When we can grow them right here, know what we're growing, uh, know what's being put into the soils and, and so it, it doesn't make any sense to just because they mass produce it to truck that stuff all the way across the country and the truck's got to go back home as well and uh, so I think you know those two issues are are big and just last evening on the news they were showing uh, these uh, wealthy people buying up thousands of acres of land out in the west and you would think that they were maybe going to farm it isn't that they're going to farm they want to they want to keep that water that's assigned to that land uh, to sell to developments uh, that are being going to be built so they have adequate water well what's going to happen to that land out west if, if that's really accurate i mean in in a week or two ago they showed farmland in the west with cracks in the soils that were three four inches wide we get that like. madison county bob here not normal summer <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, if we're gonna, if we're going to uh, secure our food availability, I think we're better off if we can do it at home here rather than relying on our friends from the Midwest and West Coast. And yeah, so, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna add, you know, it also gives all of our local farmers this level of predictability. Yeah. You know, you know you're gonna sell carrots to the elementary school, and it lets young farmers take a chance. They can open this, you know, they can come, they can lease some land, they can buy some land, they can expand their farm. We can continue to increase that incentive to buy local. Yeah, of course. So, um, yeah, you're not going to get any, any argument from anybody here. Yeah. You know that. And, um, and so, uh, but yeah, just take a minute to speak to some of that. At the staff level, um, we've been working with Ellen Kaler, who's, you know, yeah. well, and, and she's been working with the New England Feeding New England Initiative to yeah. you know, move this farm plate effort beyond Vermont, which is yeah. appropriate. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it should happen. And so um, one of the things that we've been talking about, I don't know that it's going to happen. But one of the things that we've been talking about was maybe uh, if she could kind of kick off a brown bag lunch series for New England delegation staffers in DC to raise awareness around what a uh, resilient New England food system might look like in terms of economic development, workforce development, uh, job opportunities, all of, all of it, and production and so on. So don't know where it's gonna go, but we're, we're kind of scheming and working on that. Um, we do recognize the value of um, a local you know dynamic local food system i mean if, if COVID didn't teach us anything it taught us that you know the value of local you know resilient food supplies yeah. so um so absolutely um and i know as we come up with our priorities for the farm bill this is one piece that we'd love to make sure uh can happen if we can get some language even if it's for the 28 farm bill you know get some language in there to start moving that oil tanker you know kind of in that kind of direction that you know where nationally we could recognize that national food security looks like regional food security we've, we've also talked with uh, the land trust and uh, with Gus at BHC about um, taking farmland that comes up for sale and figure trying to figure out a way that you can maybe 
bought that so that a young farmer hasn't got to buy a 400 acre farm, they could maybe lease 20 acres uh, of the field or fields to grow crops on or 10 or start out with five maybe and, and add to it. And so they can afford to, to get into um, the growing business because you know some can afford to uh, buy larger plots but many many are restricted uh, to a smaller plot and, yeah that's going to be huge going forward is access to land and not just that but also access to people who can profitably farm that land yeah. so there's a whole other level of education that's got to happen as as the farming community ages out and they're not replaced by the place-based learners who happen to be their children you know and if it's going to come from away somewhere what does that look like is it happening in our cte's is it happening in our universities where where is that going to happen and so that's another piece of that yeah it's also a capacity issue oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, and uh to the earmark that senator sanders got is like directly addressing that so farmers who are making carrots need to be able to like put them process them and put them in a package yeah. that a farm can get and usda will pay for it. and so there's like an integration piece that it continues to like mature as we get further and further in the farm to school program but we need more folks like the center for the ag economy more um, like processing hubs to like aggregate and allow these farmers uh, uh, the ab actual ability to like yeah. to do the sale. Um, it's also true, and you know, we've been growing the community eligibility uh, program in the school meals for forever, and COVID hit and it, it went away. Everyone was in a community eligibility school, but there are schools, I think a number of schools in Vermont that reach a community eligibility threshold that can't actually do universal school meals because the it's so burdensome to like track and, and find the get all the information from parents yeah. like there's a lot of detail that's required by USDA yeah. to make sure a small school in rural Vermont can feed every one of its kids yeah. and it's those issues that a the community eligibility stuff we can maybe keep expanding and trying to grow to sort of back into a universal school meal program, um, or at least expand the pool of students that that's eligible to, but it need, it requires a lot of work with USDA to make sure that schools can actually that meet those standards can actually yeah, access that yeah. benefit. Yeah. Yeah. See the the SNAP program. Um, what we did here about the. Uh, universal meals is and we we ask schools to still do the income eligibility thing if there was some some way that <clears throat> that those people in I'll use my term Troy if there's some way that Troy could get the snap participants number you know it doesn't have to be john jones or but just a number uh, that lives in troy they're on snap well you could add up pretty quick the number of children that would qualify for free or reduced uh, meals and then uh, the school would add that to their findings and get credit for that. Now you have to send the paper to the individual and they have to fill it out. And I mean, if, if they don't feed their children or have product to feed their children breakfast at home uh, before they go to school, maybe they just aren't going to fill out the paper to send in as well and it, I would think I know confidentiality is a big issue but if they could just send the feds could just send a number you know and 
and so it would allow the community to get credit for those free uh, or reduced functions. That would it would help us a great deal. I don't know if I'm thinking way way off base here or not. No, I mean that kind of, that data is available. It's like oh, there. Yeah. It's like in the census data. It's in other government agencies. It we relying on the school district and parents to meet a threshold of community eligibility through like one piece of paperwork at a time seems absurd in in now and so it it is just preventing kids from eat that should have access to universal meals access in exactly. schools it's particularly a challenge in troy it's like it's you know it's hard in burlington but they do it because they have the resources to do it Chase but, it. yeah but um in smaller schools and smaller communities it's much much harder and the resources I are mean, much thinner i i don't see where a hot lunch program uh is gonna work any better because they know that mrs so-and-so's child deserves free lunch or but if it was just a number uh, yeah. and uh, that uh, no. so it's something to think yeah. about richie you had that thing about uh, so, so piggybacking off that, yeah, um, the uh, the IRS knows what most households are making, does it not? I mean, yeah. the NSA has information about all of us. Uh, this information is there. It actually resides somewhere in Washington. Can we just be smart about merging that data and finding out which districts are deserving of how many reduced meals? It, it just seems like a no-brainer. I had two children and I wasn't working two jobs, and I don't know if I would have had the bandwidth to fill out a form if I needed to. I mean, this is not common sense yeah. to expect, say, a single mom with one child even who's trying to make ends meet to be filling out a form like I just tracked down this weekend. It, it's just hard. It's really hard yeah. to do that and, and get it in on time or whatever. Um, let's make it easier. Right. We have the data. 100% on board, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll call it the McLaren bill. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So. I think I can speak for everybody here that we are very grateful and appreciative of the help from our federal partners to yeah. get to the uh, breakfast and lunch situation. Um, and you mentioned, Ryan, and I don't know, most of that appropriation probably didn't come from the farm bill. It probably was from the rescue plan money or some similar kind of relief situation. But you also mentioned that the farm bill runs out of uh, the field, so to speak, uh, and the deadline that it's probably going to just be re-upped. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to put an allocation, a line item in that for this program that we're talking about, or does it strictly have to come from someplace else? It just seems like, I mean, everybody kind of thinks it's a great idea, but we can't figure a way to do it. Yeah. Um, once you, the problem is once you open it, you kind of like open it. So there'll be a lot of reluctance to like yeah. change a thing okay. until they have the whole package. Um, but we doesn't mean we'll stop trying because I hear you. I mean, it's yeah, it's yeah. Or so Senator Snow's yeah. idea of some sort of matching situation could, could be worked out. Uh, it, it makes it easier to sell it here. Yeah, sure. I'm yeah. sorry, Rich. Go ahead. You. I'm also. I we just I just have to say um, with all of this, you know, we're. Um, talking about school lunch and school breakfast and all that, as the cutbacks come and the supplemental programs to things like three squares and those people that are truly in need are um, um, the supplemental programs for three squares are going away. Yeah. So we're cutting back on, um, on um, food programs for the people that I consider um, truly needy. And as we do that, I hope you don't forget those and you don't just go after um, the new programs to... Yeah, absolutely. We will. I, I, I just have to say that because yeah. the supplemental programs to three squares are going away. Right. End of this month? And it's going to hit people in April? Yeah, and it's going to hit people in April and it's going to hit the truly needy. Yeah. Yeah. Did we add some of our uh, hot lunch uh, staff in, and they, like at the end of the day, 
they had a food glut. You know, they make too much or run out of this, but they've got this. And, and they put that on a shelf. So if kids, uh, when they check out, want to go home, uh, they can walk by the shelving area and, and pick different foods up, put them in a knapsack to take home. And because uh, we were wondering, we asked the question, well, what do you do with food that's left over? And uh, that sounded like a, a pretty good idea. Uh, and of course, some of our smaller schools, you know, they have one person. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they might get lucky and have a person and a half or two. But um, up in the kingdom, a lot of the hot lunch programs are run by one or one and a half people. Um, and so they're, you know, they're working hard to not be overloaded with labor. And uh, it's really, it's really amazing how how the hot lunch agents, the school personnel, the school nurses, uh, there's not one, we haven't had one complaint uh, or ways to make it better. Uh, you know, they said that they're having problems getting the forms filled out. And, and uh, so we've got to work more on helping them with that. You've been uh, hearing from the School Nutritionist Association, I'm guessing? Pardon? School Nutritionist Association folks? Well, we had, um, what's her name? Uh, Rosie. Rosie, Rosie Luger. Luger. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you know, the, what a difference a year makes. Um, <laughs> last year when we were getting this all put together, and, the year before it was worse, but last year was still questionable about, well, I don't know if we can do it, and, you know, it's going to be this hard, and it's going to cost $40 million, and, and this year, um, it, it, real positive attitude about the way it went, and, and uh, how well it's working, and uh, so I, it, you know, it, it's a big shift in a positive, very positive way. Yeah. Um, other questions? Uh, no. No, for you Thank folks, you. got any more uh, questions for us? Did uh, you cover the organic piece? Of, you asked me a question about organic dairies, and I, did we answer that to your satisfaction? There's, well, uh, there is a dairy margin coverage. An organic dairy margin protection program would be nice. Yes, you right. know, well, uh, it, it needs to be a different, I mean, the same type of program, except for the feeds up here and the milks up here. Yeah. So it would be a, a different level. Exactly. Right. And, yeah, that um, matches their need and their situ unique situation. Because yes. their pay price hasn't changed for six or eight years. And so. you were at that meeting earlier uh, about seven to eight, six to eight dollars. Well, the other day we had a hearing, the last Thursday morning, <laughs> we had a hearing that lasted from maybe 10.30 on the organic stuff, 10.30 till quarter after 12 or something like that. And then we we got off because we thought it was over, <clears throat> and and we had other obligations. Um, and then Thursday afternoon, uh, late in the afternoon, I got got a note that the house had voted a, a request out to approach for nine point two million which was equal to five dollars a hundred weight mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. entire 22 year mm -hmm. and i said well golly you know we should have heard this between 10 30 and uh, 10 and noon not uh, after supper or during supper hour uh, thursday night because you know there's a lot of 
ins and outs and planning and and coordinating and and because uh, Rich and I both set on appropriations over here. Okay. Well, we're going to get drilled with some serious questions. <laughs> Well, what are you guys and I doing? Because we're all in the same bucket. You know? <laughs> and and uh, so, you know, anything that could happen in, in D.C. to set that DMC program up a little different uh, to help those people when feed costs go right through the roof and and fertilizer because they have to use organic fertilizer. Yep. That would it would help I think our hundred and forty or so organic guys a great deal and and we certainly don't want to lose any of them. Okay. Um, you know they keep our rural landscape open and pasture their animals and um, you know, people, people don't drive here to look at my my friends, Red Shepherds, uh, big uh, row of barns and the cows in there. They can see them through the doors in the summer. With, and uh, they, they come to see animals out in the field. And, and uh, the other thing we're bumping up against uh, uh, as you know, we've done diversification for for many years, and a lot of farms are diversifying to do on-farm <coughs> events of different types, and we're bumping up against uh, zoning and Act 50, and uh, you know, quite a few different regulations that that some of us would like to change uh, to allow this to go on but you know we're we're getting further and further we our representatives and are further and further away from the growing up on the farm mm -hmm. and and they don't always understand that you constantly have to be changing things to survive and uh, so that's a that's our you know <laughs> that's one of our issues that we need to work out here in Vermont. Well, and, yeah, Senator Sanders is an early supporter of, of agritourism. You sure. know, with some early ear earmarks in that, and, and there's a quite a, a vibrant agritourism group. If you, you've already you've met them, maybe or should be meeting with them soon, because yeah. they're um, they're kind of rocking it in a way. They're doing a really great job. They brought they had a international workshop here in Burlington, 540 people, you know, from 38 nations, you know, hosted here in the state. So there's some good people doing really good work, and you know, you, you could probably get some good advice from yeah, that. So, can't we yeah. usually have that then and, yeah. and uh, you know from from veggies to small animals to maple yeah. uh, you know they uh, but if you can get people to come here and to go visit the farm got one place in Heartland on White River the guy's got these small tiny homes okay. and um he rents them out uh, for the weekend or whatever, and and state laws. He was having to take <coughs> make spaghetti lots on his farm uh, because they had to have two acres with with each house. You know the the as big as this room maybe, and you had to, so he had to go out and. and and do the acreage, and but we got, you know, we did get that fixed, and and uh, so we're, you know, we have some good things that happen, but we need a lot more to entice and help these people, because they're they're really clever on the, what they're doing and how they're doing it, and. and uh, uh, let us know how we can support. Yeah. Thanks. Well, so, Rick, you, um, 
we danced around the whole issue. Of, um, it's really hard for anybody in um, small agriculture is dying here as it's dying across the country. And the same trends, do, whether it's dairy or it's a, and part of that is in, in relationship and, and I support the um, purchase of development rights programs. That, but now when, um, in my area, in, when larger farmers are buying up land that is floodplain and now it's three to five thousand dollars um, an acre to do that no young people can come up with the capital we have to figure out a better way to support young people in small agriculture to move ahead so anything that you guys can see to do that is important you know um, I see young people in my area, they go to work for the bigger farmers, and but they can't get into agriculture themselves because the cost of production is still so high even with the programs that we've got. I, I think it's safe to say that, that one of the um, real problems with uh, the loss of small farms and so forth uh, is the loss of farm families yep. and farm kids. And yeah. the local economy suffers from that. No, but, he, but even if you are a kid that knows how to, you right. can't get the capital to get in. That's right. Yeah. Sure. And even, and then the markets. we thought 25, 30 years ago, you buy the development rights and, and they would be able to buy, and they can. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to think about other things we can do to help them get in. Happy to be part of that conversation. Yeah, I think there will be a relatively robust conversation around land access, both for that reason, for young farmers. You know, you see consolidation in the industry and everything is, is getting bigger and bigger. It makes it much harder to get in. Yeah. And then also like equity issues. There's a lot, there's a, there's a, there, we've had, Peter's um, been on a number of bills in the recent past and some of this stuff is tied up in litigation at this point, but there is a there are or like there is an intention within the Biden administration to provide access to land to young people in uh, marginalized communities that have been prevented historically in like yep. documented ways by specifically by USDA from owning and farming land and so it's certainly something that we're interested in supporting as we move forward here. Yeah, I say it with no answers, but. You know that. Yeah. yeah. What about uh, like a few a few years back we we talked about uh, community or an area based digester mm -hmm. like in the Mattawee Valley. I think you were here then, Will. Mm -hmm. And we we never got good traction on that and. <clears throat> The, the big reason, I think, was that <clears throat> the farmers got to chewing, arguing, mm -hmm. that I had better manure than you had, and how do I know I'm gonna get my good manure back to strike? And, but I think those days are, are gone. But the gas from our manure is still there. And if we could, I'm, my question is, I'm wondering if, is there any federal money to help build a digester, say, in the Mattawee Valley where farmers could take their manure, get it processed through that, make energy out of the gas, uh, or even if it was if it was designed so it sat near the gas lines that we had, uh, they could take that gas and put it right into the to the gas line even, and and not not do electricity but pump it in. If, do you know if there's any where you can? 
I, I don't know about federal funds for exactly what you proposed, but there, um, you know, there's a lot of support for methane on farm digesters and. And the Goodrich farm down in Salisbury, I believe, yeah. is pumping gas doing just what you're talking about. Yeah. So with other food waste and other other waste products, I think part of the issue, if I remember right, is, is was the transportation and the hauling of stuff. That uh, um, they've done studies. I know years ago they did a study. Uh, ANR did a study for a com you know municipal compost or decentralized compost facilities around the state, and I think they felt that uh, 20 miles was the max in terms of transportation. So they needed lots of little satellite entities accepting food scraps for composting in order for it to, but they could be more than 20 miles away from the facility in order to be profitable. I'm sure the same would be true in the north. Right. Um, well, our farms are getting I know. Out that's, more and more and more. So that's why they have on-farm on facilities. But the little, you know, for small farms to do a small digester. There's technology there where it can happen, small yes, and rural so. digesters. Yeah. Not necessarily to scale so they could tap into a gas line right. or yeah. even yeah. feed a, a, a generator, but um, but for gas, I mean, for on-farm gas use or something like that. You know, they're, I've seen them, they're, they exist, the technology exists. Yeah. So, right. so that's there then. Yeah. yeah. Anything else from the committee? No, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. No, uh, Thanks for all your work. Yeah. Thank you uh, for coming. And you know, if you feel at any time you need something from us, uh, feel free to, to contact us. And, and uh, but don't forget, we're looking to you for big things. <laughs> <laughs> you won't let us forget. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very, very nice uh, uh, having you in, David. It was nice uh, meeting you. And, good to meet you. And uh, good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Say hi to that. Yeah, yeah, certainly will. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, yeah. vice versa. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. I'm sure the same with yeah. these two. Anytime. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Very yeah. good. I go very far in the afternoon to do so. I don't. <laughs> I know, exactly. I love it. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. It's great. So, uh, welcome to the, um, we, we have the uh, John Rogers coming yep. in at uh, quarter of the And I think Piper and Yep. Yeah, we got the whole crew coming in on. I got that. I'm going to get a support for this. Thanks. Um, coming in on cannabis um, next. So we got a. Oh, we're okay. going to get a real break. Well, good morning. Uh, we're back from our break from this morning earlier. We talked with a uh, uh, congressional delegation and uh, had a good uh, conversation with them. And uh, now we're moving to cannabis. Um, and uh, former Senator uh, John Rogers sent us a list of, of uh, yes. Everybody got the rank? Yeah, I think we're all Oh, you are? Uh, yes. Yeah. So you have a new one. I added a couple things to the oh, bottom. Oh, he's added to it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This is the 20 uh, list. So, yes, yeah, uh, you want the list of 20. You got one extra. I don't know what he's actually saying. All right, yeah, there's a week or two ago that John uh, sent that. And we talked about it in the. Uh, in committee and thought we would invite John and the uh, cannabis uh, people in uh, to talk about, well, as a grower and a producer, uh, thought we'd hear from you first and then we'd move on to others to uh, see how things are working for them. So, Welcome, it's good to see you and have you back in the building. Excellent, thank you, uh, Senator Starr, and thank you, committee. Uh, I haven't met. Uh, should we introduce well, ourselves? Yeah, well, we do a little quick run around. Well, Brian Ballamore, the Rutland District, John and I know each other. Irene Runner, in the North, including Fairfax. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Um, and I know I know the rest of the cast Richard of characters, and, and this one too. I, I remember Brian, I remember him. So. 
So anyway, excellent. Um, yes, thank you. Know, you. I'll, I'll launch right in. Um, so as the senators who served with me know, I uh, grew hemp for years before uh, adult use cannabis became legal. And, and one of the things, and I've talked with both uh, James Pepper and, and Carrie Gajer at the CCB about this, um, we did a heck of a lot of work with this committee on hemp, and I think we built a heck of a hemp program. And I was extremely disappointed to hear that the Agency of Ag gave up on our hemp program and sent it back to the USDA. Uh, I hope they don't give up on dairy farmers when they get down to a certain number. And, and you know, the, the things that bothers me about cannabis, both hemp and the adult use cannabis, is the legislatures put together programs that are supposed to support themselves in fees and no other department or agency that I know of in state government has that charge. Um, the cannabis, both, both types, are creating sales that create sales tax uh, and economic development and that goes back into the general fund. Some general fund money should be used to prop up both of those uh, organizations uh, as an aside. Um, but what I would like to do is have hemp defined as any cannabis with a THC level of under 1% and put the hemp program under the CCB. It's the exact same plant. It has different cannabinoids. I personally believe these cannabinoids are gonna be more important than ever. Um, there are a lot of people who go for just the highest THC. Uh, those are the folks, they're like the folks that wanna drink their whiskey straight. Um, but the other cannabinoids for medicinal purposes, for pain relief, for inflammation, and for the entourage effect, the experience of, of actually being um, mellowed or calmed without being super psychoactive, the CBD and the CBG are extremely important. So, um, and my hope would be that the hemp growers would only have to register, pay a registration fee. I just threw a hundred dollars out there. Just for uh, your information, the last, I've got a, a ton or two of hemp biomass sitting in my barn right now that I'll probably have processed myself at some point. But the last offer I got on my hemp was $1.75 a pound. Now your plant average under a pound and the seed cost me a dollar. So you can see there's not much profit in hemp today. The only reason we're still doing it is because when we started out, uh, we had an idea that the, the hemp prices were not going to remain what they were. We didn't think they would drop so precipitously so quickly, um, but we make our own products. And so the only hemp we grow now is to make our own products. And you can, you can draw a, sort of a parallel with, with people who are in the dairy business. If you sell your milk in the bulk tank, you're probably not making much. If you're making cheese or yogurt on the farm and adding that value, you can actually make more money. So we've been able to stay in the hemp business that way, making our products. We get feedback from people. That's really what's kept me in the business. I have chronic back pain, so I've been, that's why I, one of the reasons I got into it, um, and I use it every day, and it helps me with my pain. But we've heard incredible feedback from our customers about how it's changed their lives. And that really, <clears throat> excuse me, makes it rewarding enough to make you wanna to stay in the business. We're not making a ton of money with the CBD, but it is growing and it is uh, somewhat profitable. Um, so hemp is considered an agricultural product and you, you'll see on my number four on the list, all cannabis uh, grown outdoors should be considered an agricultural product. It's a plant, it's agriculture. Growing plants is agriculture. Um, yeah. the, the wording would have to be played with, and I know we've got uh, masters in our legislative staff with wording. We don't want the ag agency to have anything to do with it. But for the growing of the plant, it needs to be considered agriculture. If you have a farm, that is fallow and you've got a neighbor that wants to get into the cannabis business and rent a piece of land from you, if it's over a thousand square feet, you got to take it out of current use. 
Now, if you're going to take it out of current use, you're going to get your current use penalty, which is going to cost you more than the guy can afford to pay you for the rent. So nobody's going to do it. We got farm buildings sitting empty that could be used to dry. That's where I dry mine in an old dairy barn. In, in the hay barn, it's 40 by 190. Uh, people actually got in trouble this year for um, drying in some of their ag buildings because their ag buildings were in current use. And I think, I think that's just silly. For current use and land use, both state and municipal, it should be considered agriculture under the CCP. And why, why couldn't it be there? Is there any... Just because our laws don't specifically say that it is. It, currently, it's not considered agriculture. And I think that was something that happened in the, in the other chamber. Hmm. So, that, um, yeah, that, that should be an issue that we need to chat. If it's hemp, it's agriculture. If it's cannabis, it's not. It's exactly the same plant. I make the comparison between a Granny Smith apple and a Red Delicious. It's exactly the same plant, but they have different flavors. So the hemp and the THC have different cannabinoids. That's the only difference. It's the exact same plant. Do they look exactly, exactly. You alike? Couldn't, you couldn't tell the difference. Walking through the field, you can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, have, so they should both be considered ag. It should be all ag, uh, right, for every purpose except for the agency and of ag needs to be kept the out of cannabis it. Cannabis control board look at. Yeah, uh, yeah, everything to do with both the hemp and the THC cannabis should be under the CCB in my view. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and then uh, line five is sort of a reiteration, all, all cannabis grown and processed on existing farms, traditionally farmland and farm buildings, it should be considered agriculture, both state at the state and municipal level. And who told you your barn or a barn couldn't be in current use? Well, they, they, my barn isn't in current use, so it doesn't really matter to me, but I heard through, uh, we're a pretty tight, a uh, small guys are a pretty tight knit group and we do a lot of networking and, and talking with each other. And so um, there's a lot of folks that are, are saying that there's a lot of problems out there with it not being agriculture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Rick. So if it was agriculture in the barn, the indoors. Yep. Yeah. Um, because we've had other conversations about um, and moving towards uh, having further conversations about what a tips Act 250. If it was agriculture in the barn, it wouldn't tip Act, act right, 250. Exactly. But, um, but now, because it's a commercial product, it um, would tip Act 250. And there again, most farmers are not going to put their right. farm under Act 250. They're just not going to do it. So it's a missed economic opportunity for farmers in farmland uh, to, to not have it in agriculture. Well, is it is it a commercial product before it goes in the barn? I mean, how is it uh, milk's a commercial product? Uh, so doesn't it have to dry before it's worth much? Yes, yes, absolutely. It's got, yeah. So it's a raw product as it goes into the mm -hmm. facility. Yep. But remind us of the license. If you licenses, you have a growing license. And there's a, um, the middle man is the processor. There's growing, um, there's manufacturing, there's processing, there's retail. But the growing part. The growing part is what I'm talking about. Yeah. The growing, what it, it, it should be agriculture, um, especially outdoors. If you're, if you're putting it in 
the former Toys R Us building in Williston. I can see that being commercial. You're in a commercial space, you're in a commercial building. But when you live on a farm or are renting from a farmer, like Richie, whose family has been farming for generations on that farm, it should be considered agriculture. Yeah. Every aspect of it should be. It is agriculture. You're growing plants. But but in the barn, if you go over a thousand square feet, which isn't all that big a space. It isn't all that big. Thirty by thirty two by thirty two. Well ten ten by hundred is the easy way to figure it, or twenty by fifty, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, but if you in the barn you go over a thousand square feet, then it becomes commercial too. Yeah. And then we have to, the question of what the commercial space is versus the ag space, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's way more confusing than it needs to be, the way, yeah, the way it is right quite now. A lot more confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, currently, I take my biomass to my processor and he turns it into distillate, which looks like honey. It's thick, golden colored stuff. I can't, and I believe the CCB, I talked with James and this is one of their legislative asks, but I can't go and pick up my own distillate because it's been concentrated. This puts the farmers at a serious disadvantage because now I have to pay somebody to go pick that up and take it to the manufacturer or somebody else. I need to be just like a sugar maker, maker where I can have my liters sitting on a shelf and when a manufacturer calls me up and says I need a liter of distillate, I can take that distillate to them. Otherwise, we're, we're basically making it so farmers are are very limited to wholesale or less than wholesale prices because we can't handle our own concentrates. In that uh, UPS or? No, you can't, you can't send any of that stuff through a carrier. You have to deliver it. So it has to be a licensed carrier? Yep. Yeah, so like uh, <clears throat> the manufacturers and the processors and the wholesalers are all uh, in their license able to to move those concentrates but it's I think it was more an oversight than anything else but if the small farmers are going to make it we need to be able to value add just like other types of agriculture are allowed to value add that's the only way we're going to be able to make it um, and on that note um, I'm not sure how much you all know about these processes but there is a process um, called ice water extraction, which I would like farmers to be allowed to use. There are no, no solvents, no alcohol. You basically put the flour into ice water and agitate it. And the trichomes, which are the little tiny pieces of the plant that hold the medicine, drop to the bottom. You put it through a series of screens and what you're left with is just the, the hash, they call it hash, but it's just the medicinal part. And the, then you get rid of the, the plant material that has very little or no value left to it. It's a, it's a very super, super simple, safe extraction method in a way for farmers to add value to their product that we think we should be allowed to do. And who, like who would be opposed to that? I don't know if anybody would be opposed to it. I think you're going to have to uh, wait and see. I don't know, maybe some of the processors would be, but I can't see it because there's not very many people offering that service. Um, so I, I don't think there's going to be opposition to it, but I've been in this building long enough to know to it, it, anything can happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, many of us growers would like the ability to sell seeds and live plants to the public without an additional license. It's just another way to make a little bit of money in the springtime when us outdoor growers, you know, are, are pretty much out of our plant material and spending money on fertilizers and irrigation and all that other stuff. And it's, some people see it as another uh, revenue stream. And how, how would you control 
who who has who's bought seeds and who's growing uh, this product. See, now you have to be licensed and and all that to be able to do that. Right, but we also have the law that allows homeowners to grow their three. three I think it's eight total. Anybody know for sure? Eight total and two mature? Uh, two, yeah, two and seven. Eight total and two mature plants. So that means that home growers could come and buy their eight plants from you in the springtime so that they didn't have to start them or they could buy their seeds from you. Because one of the problems even folks like us are having um, is, is getting the genetics. And, you know, a lot of the people that are in the business have been growing in the black market. So they already had their strains figured out and everything. But like myself, um, I gave up the black market a long time ago when I got into politics. So uh, I don't I don't have any of my old strains. So I'm starting from scratch. Um, and it's 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 quite a challenge because you have to trust the guy on the other end of the phone because you're sending him an awfully large check and you don't know what's in those little brown seeds and if it's going to produce what they told you it's going to produce or not and both in the hemp and cannabis industry there have been an awful lot of people selling seeds that are not what they promised them to be so this is just and a way you know, to help I take it they're a lot better than what you thought you were going to get <laughs> sometimes <laughs> you can count them on one hand yeah exactly <laughs> um one of the requirements that i clearly do not understand is to be able is operating on only one parcel of land myself personally um, we have the place where we started our our hemp business where we've got a small indoor grow room where we start the plants and we've got a greenhouse attached to the workshop where we take them after they're germinated and started and put them out and, and get them ready for the field in 2019 we bought the farm that's been in my family for two some 200 years uh to try to increase it where we were before there wasn't much farmland we wanted to increase the the scale of our hemp operation at that time bought the farm is really bad timing <laughs> just before covid hit we opened our bed and breakfast and and two months before it closed and uh because of covid in the hemp market went like that but anyways um so currently i have a mile and a half down the road a perfect place to start my plants and under the current framework i can't use it because it's not attached to my farm um, so it would be nice if, if we could expand it to at least two parcels. I mean, just like many dairy farmers, all their parcels where they hay aren't connected. The land doesn't abut, and I don't know, as long as you have it listed so the CCB knows where everything you have is, I don't understand why we would limit it to one parcel. So I think it was maybe an oversight, but there, there was probably somebody that, that thought it was a good idea. Um, let's see, where am I here? Uh, number 11. Um, we're hoping to have some sort of direct to consumer uh, sales because there again. So did I bring them? Yeah, got a sample right here. So. We have the expense of the genetics. This is one of our single joints in the tube. Um, so we've already paid, already paid, uh, I think we, we bought enough seeds, so it was three bucks a seed. And we did the tilling and the planting and the care of the plants. And we, we uh, grew them out and harvested them and dried them and broke them down and trimmed them and cured them and ground them up and stuffed them in a paper in a glass tube with a ridiculous label that doesn't leave any room for a story about your own farm. And we're selling those for $5.95 a piece. Now, when they go into a retail store, most of the retailers are doubling the price. 
So they're making 595 on that joint. I'm not making 595 on that joint. I'm selling it for 595, but I'm making a fraction of that because of all the cost I incurred going into it. And even if it starts out as a limited opportunity to, to sell, uh, be it special events or limited number of days a month that we could sell direct to the public, I could actually sell that for the 12 or 15 bucks that the retail stores are getting. Back to... What is that? That, it's a joint. It's a cigarette. You want it, you can smoke it later and steady your other one. Probably better for you. It is way better for you. Non-carcinogenic. <laughs> All up, Brian. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, it's just uh, it's just another way that the farmers can make a little bit more money. Just like a farmer taking fruits and vegetables to the farmers market yeah. is getting retail instead of wholesaling it to the store. And, and you know, my perspective in both the hemp and the cannabis when when I was here is trying to help the small. Vermont farmers be able to make a, a living and stay in it. I like now, using glass, also not plastic. That, that's of one of the, the rules. How many of the Great. small producers of the thousand square feet make things like this? A lot of them, because even though there's more labor in that than anything else, it's adding the most value to your product. Mm -hmm. And that's another problem in the market right now is that I've heard some farmers getting ridiculously low offers on their on their biomass. So just like milk, the middleman's trying to buy it low and sell it high. And, and so this is this is a way we can kind of control our own destiny. And you do have a lot of labor costs in it because believe me, it, it takes a long time to get that thing prepped and, and ready for sale. Did we prescribe what you had to put on that label? Yes. And it, it is just, it's completely over the top. <laughs> you can't even, you can barely fit everything yeah. that we're required to put on a label on the label. And like I said, it leaves you no room to tell your story. It leaves you just the bare minimum to be able to get your information on the tube. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that I had to do and in, in, uh, all growers have to do, I think all cannabis licensees have to do, is they made me escrow $2,500 in case I go out of business. And like I, I said to the CCB on my application, if I go out of business, I'm going to try to sell it to another licensed establishment. And if I can't, I'll put it in a pile and light a match to it, just like I have done with hemp that uh, you know wasn't fit for consumption or I had too much hemp. I've had to burn it a couple times, and it doesn't cost me a darn thing. But what they what these rules have done is taken twenty five hundred dollars of my money that I could really use right now, and it's sitting in an escrow in case I go out of business, which I think is silly. If you have a big retail shop and you got thousands of items in the back room, maybe that makes sense. But for the for the outdoor farmers, it, it, to me, it doesn't make any sense. It's it's wasting my money uh, and setting my money on the sideline. So it's twenty five hundred. Yeah, that you sat in an escrow account. Um, Number 13, remove the requirements that employees of grow operations need a background check and pay $50 to the CCB uh, for, for a registration. Um, we don't do this with any other employees. You know, uh, I have feelings about the, the whole background check thing anyway. Uh, but anyways, if you want to background check the owner, make sure you know they got nothing, no red flags, fine. But we should be able to hire people that we trust. And what this does is, um, like I have a son that lives in Virginia. So he comes up for a weekend or a week vacation, and you know growing up on the farm, you take everybody's help you can. When, uh, when people show up and they offer to help and you're working, well, he legally, he can't work. He can't come out to the field with us and help me. Why? Just because I have to, to do it, he would have to go through a background check in the application process and send another $50 to the CCB. And we pay, I paid $6,500 for my license. 
and put $2,500 in an escrow and another $1,800 in liability insurance, which I don't understand because if anybody's in my crop, they're on posted property, um, then nobody's supposed to be there. And so it's just cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. You got 10 grand into your 1,000 square feet. In the, my, I have a tier three, so I got 6, 000, uh, 625 plants outdoors is what I grow. But it's just, it's to me, it's nickel and, it's nickel and dime in us, and, and we should have control over, over who we hire. And why shouldn't we maybe hire somebody who has a, a shaded past? Don't, I mean, shouldn't we give people a chance in, in society? And it should be just like every other business in the state, it should be our choice who we trust and who we hire. Well, when the burden would be on the owner anyways, if something. The captain goes down with the ship. Yeah. Agreed. How is that enforced? I, I don't know if there's any enforcement. I don't think there's much enforcement in the whole process. And that's why I think a lot of the process is, is quite silly because they got these requirements and they don't have enough manpower to even check up on it. The, I went down and did a delivery at um, Mountain Girl down in Rutland. Yeah. And he said he keeps sending in his reports and sends them an email. Am I doing this right? Is everything okay? Hasn't even heard back from him. We sent in some product registrations a couple months ago. We haven't even heard back from them. Uh, they just, they don't have the manpower to do all of this stuff. So requiring us to jump through those hoops is a little bit silly. Uh, maybe they haven't got the $50 to register their employees. <laughs> And then the other place they get us for 50 bucks, and from my perspective, it's not even clear what we're supposed to be doing is product registration. And like I said, we sent in our product registration and they haven't even gotten back to us to tell us it's okay or not. Um, but every product you put in, they charge you 50 bucks for. I think my license fee is more than enough to cover everything I need to do. So if I put this strain in this tube, is this one product and I put a different strain in this tube and it's a second product is it a, a second product if I put three of those in a box instead of one in the tube it's like it's to me it's just silly we should have to send in our labels make sure we got everything on them and register the product no fee it, and it's determined to be registered unless they get hold of us and say no there's a problem you didn't put something on your label it should, it, it's just way more difficult. I have a friend that they sent uh, one in in November and still hasn't heard back. Now us as business people, I'm not in the black yet. I'm still in the red and I'm hoping in the next two weeks, I, I'm gonna finally be in the black, but that's getting no money for my labor. And I basically worked two full-time jobs last year because my masonry uh, and excavating paid for the farming. Um, and and so um, oh, you're a real farmer then. Well, I <laughs> I don't I don't get quite as many hours in as I did when we were milking cows, but I get plenty in. Yeah, but if you get into the black, you're not a real. So I guess that's probably true, <laughs> Senator Starr. But I'm really hoping this is a different type of farming. <laughs> I'm really hoping there's actually a profit in it. Well, I'll wait and prove you're not a real farmer. Uh, okay, I mean, well, that you are a I, real farmer. I, I'm you're running in. The, I think yeah. I'm hoping not to be a real farmer then. <laughs> if, if, if you're off farm job and your spouse's off okay. farm job, um, are all taken up by the firm it's not a real farm. okay well so far it's a real farm but I'm hoping to make it not one um, I think the CCB pushed the legislature to um, charge much less for license fees and I believe it was the house that decided to go up uh, where they did it's ex as I explained before it's extremely expensive to get into this and I think there's a lot of average Vermonters out there that wanted to be in this business and looked at the cost and I've talked with a few of them and said I couldn't do it mm -hmm. I cannot get in and so there needs to be some structure I think it should be reduced for everybody especially 
outdoor growing because outdoor growing is less, the, the product's less valuable um, and it's, it's tougher and it's seasonal. Um, but there, there should be some incentive, especially for new growers to allow them a reduced rate at least for the first year so they can get in, get their feet under and make a little money, then charge them full full on, whatever. But it, the, well, why the, wouldn't you charge them on their output? Uh, because if, if you're selling product out, you should be making some money on that product. Where if you had a real bad year and, mm. And for your third year, say it rained every day or whatever, and you had a bad, bad year. Um, it, I mean, it happens. I think that might be too involved and too confusing, but it, it's one. It's a risk, just like any other type of farming. We we started with just over 625 plants and ended out under 600 plants because. You have a windstorm and a couple get snapped off. Uh, you have powdery mildew show up in a couple places and you get rid of those plants as fast as you can so it doesn't spread to the other plants. I mean, there's there's things that happen just like there is with any other farming. Uh, but I, I just, I personally think the license fees are still plenty high, but if we reduce the license fees, we have to allow some general fund money to go in, as I think it should, as this is generating tax revenue for the state. Just like every other agency and department in the state gets general fund money. These guys should be no different. <coughs> uh, and that's number 16. The CCB should not be expected to operate on these things. Um, and then so, for my hemp license, I had to go through a background check. I did FBI background check. It cost me about 50 bucks. I had to go to the sheriff's office, do my fingerprints. They sent it in. Well, for some reason, we went with a private uh, company to do the background checks. The background check cost me 500 bucks. Well, you must have a long list of stuff on there. <sighs> no, it costs everybody 500 bucks, even the ones that don't make as much trouble as I do. Wow. <laughs> um, I think it's excessively expensive and I, I question the need for a background check at all, but I wanted to be sure you guys are aware of that. So I basically, I had to go through two different background checks. One cost me $50 and one cost me 500. So what was the difference between the two? The difference is the $50 one is done by the FBI and the $500 one is done by a private company that the CCB contracts with. And it's required, the second one's and it, required. It's required. required, yeah, they're both requirements. It just, it's excessive for a background check. It's another excessive cost that we shouldn't, we shouldn't have to go through. So why, why didn't the FBI background check? Well, that's a, good, that's a good question for my friend James Pepper when he comes in. I can't answer it. Does that, you think, the FBI would. You would think that be might be the that. the premium background check, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we the way the government works, <laughs> maybe I better rethink that. Yeah, they um, did try to use that, and then the, the FBI refused to to process them. Well, except that they processed they processed mine for hemp, and you can put on the form. Um, for personal use and the FBI can't refuse it. So, I mean, it'd be pretty dumb to say I'm growing pot to the FBI because it's still federally illegal. So I'm sure they wouldn't do it if you said you were in the cannabis business. But I think that can all be gotten around because every citizen has the right to ask for a background check for personal use. So that, that could be gotten around. Um, currently under the rules, we're not supposed to gift any cannabis, which which I think there again is an oversight. If I'm going into a retail operation, I think they want to, but I know I want them to have samples of my product to try to make sure they know what they're getting. I mean, I wouldn't buy a, a thousand cases of chocolate chip cookies without 
trying a cookie. At least one. At least one, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we should be able to gift, especially to cancer patients. Uh, I have a friend who who has at great risk to uh, themselves um, gives cannabis products to cancer patients. And there have been miraculous results from some of these products with cancer patients. And I think it's silly for us as a state to not allow people who have the generosity in their heart to try to help others and that right now it's illegal to gift those products even to cancer patients. And so I, I think that's something that needs to be addressed. Well, I can understand that a little better than not being able to gift a prospective seller, a retailer, if you wanted to take something in for a retail outlet to sell, I mean, you'd think they would be allowed to try something. I, I, I certainly want, wouldn't want to sell somebody's product from my store without knowing exactly what that product was. <clears throat> Um, uh, one of the big problems is uh, banking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we required the garbage collectors pick up recycling and compost, and they didn't want to. Um, I think uh, credit unions are, I believe, licensed under the state of Vermont. And I don't know why we can't require credit unions to offer banking services to people. Right now, uh, I was at a, a retailer and he told me that the credit union, and I think there's only one that's doing it, is charging him $1,500 a month to have an account there. And it's just, it's robbery. The, the banking in, insurance, the, it's legal robbery. If it says cannabis on it, they're putting it to us. Um, and and it, it's just not right. I got approved for a cash management plan, but it's still a problem because you, you've got to get paid and you've got to pay your bills. And it, it's really uh, putting us in a pickle. And us small businesses, yeah. a, all my friends that I'm working with, the manufacturers and, and processors, one of my friends in processing and manufacturing told me last month he had to borrow money from his sister to get his personal bills paid through the month. There's a lot of people out there that have put everything they have into trying to get this rolling. And like any other business, it, it takes some time to get back into the black. And uh, this is making it even harder when, when those guys are taking such a big pinch out of the limited funds we have to work with right now. It, it's really a challenge. I'm going to ask a question about that. So you think you can't use a bank, right? Right. Can't use a bank. So it's all, so in a way, nobody can really monitor the funds anyhow. Well, we're supposed to all be keeping track of it right, for, right. for the okay. CCB, okay. but yeah. You're, but how do you start anything without being able to put money into a bank? It's <laughs> it's unbelievably hard and you can't borrow money from a bank. And that's, right. that's one of my things is so how many people, how many average Vermonters have the money sitting in their bank account to start up a business like this right. and without being able to borrow? How much do a thousand square feet in your... How much would you put into this business? How much would it cost to set it up? Yeah, how much is the startup? Um, to so if you have a existing empty building, I figured the startup's a hundred thousand dollars to upfit to upfit a thousand square feet to get electrical water, all your lighting, all your air handling, and that's not going high end. You could spend a hundred thousand dollars easy. And like I said, how many average Vermonters can pull that? They can't. It's not there. <clears throat> and they supposedly this was set up to help Vermonters get into it. Exactly. And, and that's why we've got so many people trying to get their start outdoors. I don't have my indoor grow set up. Even though I applied for a tier three mixed, I haven't been able to use my indoor because I don't have it upfit because I haven't made enough money to upfit it yet. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we get enough money coming in, we're gonna start upfitting and start our indoor grow. But it's it's a struggle for average people. Um, 
And the, go ahead. Are we setting ourselves up for people who have money from outside? Exactly. We're setting ourselves up for MSOs to come in and apply for a tier three, which is 15,000 square feet, and they set up their own manufacturing and they set up their own store and they start underselling all the rest of us because let's remember, they're operating in other states. And so those guys, just like a Walmart, they'll operate at a loss if they have to, to put you out. And that's what happened in Washington state. The big ones put the little ones out and now you have weed Walmarts. And I'm a, and that's my last point on this new sheet is reduce the maximum indoor grow operations to 10,000 square feet. Maybe let the ones that are already in operate. Um, but more and more of those MSOs are coming in. Well, how big are they? 15,000 square feet is a pretty good size building. I'd say so. Yeah. And, you know, and they've got the money. They can come in and, and set it up, bing, bang, boom. They're in full scale operation because they're already operating in other states and they've got income coming from all those operations. Um, so it's a direct challenge to what myself and a lot of legislature, legislators wanted, which was to try to prop up the small craft industry because those MSOs are gonna take all that profit out of state. All us little guys that are here today, we spend our money in the community. It's going to go around and around the community and benefit Vermont, where those MSOs are going to take that money out of state. It's like our small farmers keep talking about. Mm -hmm. Gobbled yeah. up. Very small. Gobbled up. Gobbled yeah. up. This is small farming. This, yeah, is, this, is, it's, it's, this is small farming. The potential, though, to get gobbled up by the big guys is huge. Yep. Well, I can, I'm just going to be snarky, but we did miss a step. We did not have any small firms to just go straight to big rates. It's headed. Thank you. I've taken up a lot of time, and we got a couple other folks to get yeah, to. So we should uh, hear from them. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Um, you who? You next? Oh, sure. Uh, my name's Adam Gross. Everybody calls me Tito. Uh, so I agree with everything John was saying. Uh, I, I think it's all it's all incredibly important. I am going to build on it a little bit and I talk about some anecdotal stuff that's been happening to me and uh, and build on it a bit. But but mostly just to 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 grab a hold of what John was saying, it's so important for for these small Vermont farms because you see these other states and and they haven't they haven't taken these measures and. Uh, and and uh, Vermont tried to make it special by 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 gearing it towards small farms, but then these these little things that are still sticking around, making it so difficult. Um, and uh, Vermont does have the potential to have this really incredible scene here. It's so different than all the rest of the country, and I, I just love that. And so I'm here to help preserve that. Um, and um, I'm going to go a little bit farther than John, and also say that indoor cannabis should be considered agriculture as well. Um, a friend of mine, a uh, friend of mine, took over an uh, indoor lettuce uh, plant. I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, a manufacturing building for for lettuce. Now that was considered agriculture. Uh, you know, to the farmer growing indoor lettuce or growing indoor cannabis or anything else for that matter, it's all the same. You know, you're 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 still dealing with all the same stuff. Um, also, um, I definitely think hemp has got to be considered uh, or defined as cannabis uh, with a THC level of under 1%, like John was saying. Uh, I was growing indoor hemp, uh, super high CBD. I had a couple of cultivars, uh, strains that were excellent, really high CBD, over 20%, which is like you're talking serious medicinal benefit from these plants. But the THC was 0.5 instead of 0.3. And I had to literally, uh, Mike DiTomasi from, from, the, from that current uh, hemp agency had to come over. I literally had to bury it in the ground with dirt in the shovel. <laughs> like it was just awful. Uh, it was one of the worst moments of my life. Um, and, um, and that was medicine that people needed, you know, so that, and, and over a technicality, you know, you want to say 0 0.3 or, or, or 0 0.03, 0 0.05, like it's none of it is going to get you high on any level. It's, it's you know, everything under 1% is very much uh, not going to get you high in the sense like regular THC cannabis would. 
Um, I also agree that that um, uh, all things can, uh, cannabis and have need to be um, overseen by the CCB. Um, I'm also a retailer, so I'm, I'm dealing with this and the fact that like, you know, the cannabis we're growing, you um, people that choose to smoke it um, uh, or 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 uh, vaporize, dry or vape the, the healthy way, they. Um, they still have to get a tobacco license. I mean, these products are not meant for tobacco at all. 0.0% meant for tobacco. Yet we have to get a tobacco license, and then we get those stings, those those DLL stings, and and uh, you know, it's just it's just so bizarre. It's it's just not it's not helping anything. Um, sure. So you have yeah. to get a tobacco license to be able to sell cannabis. To be able to sell a cannabis pipe. Or any kind of cannabis thing that you would consume cannabis out of, yeah. And why? Uh, I guess it's not fair to ask you, but the board we can ask. Yeah. Why wouldn't they consider a cannabis license enough if you're in that business? Yeah, I think a lot of this. Um, I think a lot of this is is just oversight. I don't necessarily think there's anything uh, you know nefariously trying to bend it one way or another. It's just you know it's just how it's worked out. As the cannabis control board describes it, they're trying to uh, build a parachute as they're skydiving. You know, so um, you know there's there's definitely a lot of a lot of things getting missed for sure. Um, I think it should be that way. Um, Um, I also agree. Um, John brought up a point about um, making um, ice water extraction. This is this is just um, to people who 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 do this. It's very commonplace, um, and it's so different than other extraction in the sense that there's no big machinery, there's no solvents. There's we're talking literally a, a bag with a mesh bottom and a paddle. You're spinning it with. It's like churning butter, but you know it's like. A, to, to, to need um, you know a manufacturing license on top of that just to do that it's, it just seems odd it just doesn't really make sense uh, the requirement to only operate on one parcel of land uh, is also uh, extremely limiting so uh, myself as an indoor grower um, I have a, a very small building here we're talking about I'm a tier two grower so uh, you know I'm, I'm allowed 2500 square feet of total canopy all my plants all together uh, only allow that much. So then, you know, I'd like to get a bigger license, um, you know, in the future after my business works, I, I'd like to upgrade and, and maybe move on. But now, do I have to now shut down that building that I, I just, you know, um, John was saying, you know, $100,000 or so to, to make that investment for me and my building, try a million dollars. Million bucks. Yeah, I couldn't even I couldn't even fill my whole building at first. I have to just go half because I after you know tapping every single penny I've ever had in my life and and my and some money from some family members, that's all I could do. Um, so I mean the expenses are wild. So for example, if I could take advantage of that uh, tax exemption for farmers on equipment, I mean you know that could put. A, a wild amount of money back in, in my pocket. Um, and uh, and I'm trying to do it right with all LED lights and all really cutting edge equipment that is, uh, that's all very green. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm making all those efforts. It would be great to be considered agriculture because let me tell you, when I got my hands in, in my soil or I'm watering my plants, it, it, it feels all the same to me. I don't, I don't see what the difference is. So. Um, and um, also uh, he brought up the escrow account, the, the, uh, they call it a cessation escrow account. So if, you're, if you go out of business, you have to have this money in this account ready to go. And I just I can't wrap my head around that one either because you know I'm imagining myself going out of business. Okay, the whole thing doesn't work out, goes out of business. Like, I don't see what that $2,500 is gonna, is gonna do in that scenario at all. Plus, you know, I have all this equipment. If I went out of business, I'm gonna sell all my equipment. I'm gonna you know, try to liquidate all my assets. This, this amount is just stifling those small farmers because we had to put all this money up front before we were making any, any revenues. That's why this has been so difficult, so incredibly difficult. And do you know the purpose of the escrow account? No, I have never had somebody explain it to me in a way that I can understand. I, I don't fully get it. Um, and uh, the $50 registering for every product is so overbearing. I definitely agree with John very much there. 
um, and uh, also about the CCB um, not operating on fees alone. Um, I think that this this market is way too important to Vermont in general uh, to not have parity with other departments. Um, I, I think it's just too important. This is not only. I also want to also say this. This can make an immense dent in the problem we have of young people leaving the state. I mean, if these small farms are all able to, to, to take part in this vibrant new scene we have in this new marketplace, the young people are going to stay. I've witnessed it uh, uh, myself. Um, and um, it's a serious problem. And, and this, can, this can solve it. Uh, let let the, this cool scene we have, of, instead of uh, two or three mega grows. By the way, we're, we're talking 15,000 square feet. In other states, you're talking like half a million square feet. Uh, mega buildings uh, that you need a golf cart to get from one end to the other, you know? Um, and I love that Vermont has this little patchwork of all small companies. It's so vibrant and exciting, um, and it's super exciting to young people. So um, I think we got to do whatever we can to foster it. Um, and uh, and also the background checks, just lastly, that, that $500 uh, requirement is, is really intense. Um, uh, you have to do the same? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, every employee you, you hire has to go through that process. But those employees don't go through that special, the $500 background check? That's everybody, owners, employees, everybody. I mean, that's kind of weird. Uh, yeah. We need to check that. Sure. Yeah. But I really appreciate your time. Uh, that's, I guess that's my two cents for today. I kept it quick. But where, thank you. where are you out? Uh, I'm in Addison County. Addison County? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Right there by the lake. Nice. <laughs> Maybe it was there. Was it his representative senators that put this together? I don't know if Addison has senators, actually. <laughs> Addison County have any representation um, in the Senate? We have, uh, oh, in the Senate. Uh, I only know my House representatives. I'm yeah, sorry. That's I, what I, I thought. Yeah, I don't know. Well, you're going to get to know your senators. Yeah, yeah I know. Geez. I know my House. I, I, well, I moved from Bristol, so I didn't mind defense. No. I just, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. Well, we'll add to some study. We'll we'll you should give them two senators at some point. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm going to leave out a few. <laughs> I always wait to get off to Golden Bell. <laughs> All right, Wyoming County 4. Rowling County, or yeah, we could add a couple of Yeah. That's a good idea, Ryan. <laughs> uh, it doesn't happen. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, too. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Jesse? You still hey, with morning. us? Morning. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you guys from Charlotte. Thank you, Senator Sauer. Thank you, Ag Committee, for seeing us today. Um, thank you, Mr. Rogers and Tito very much for all that you guys said. I think that covered so much of what I'm here to speak about also. But one thing that I wanted to sort of make kind of clear is our case that what we're dealing with here in Charlotte, um, we're dealing with oversight from our town that is going above and beyond what the statute for the state has sort of put forth. And they're really finding ways to kind of push cannabis out of Charlotte if they possibly can by creating these new rules and regulations that are going above and beyond, which could all of a sudden be alleviated if we could bring cannabis just under an ag, um, an ag um, uh, delineation. And so um, that's something that I'm facing here right now. And my fear is that if other towns, if this town passes stuff that's going to prohibit that. That's what's going to sort of set a precedence for potentially other towns. And I really try to want to, I want to get ahead of this now before our town sets it up and creates future problems for other cannabis farmers that would want to maybe farm in Charlotte or also in other parts of the state. And that's something that's pretty concerning to us that we're dealing with right now that's causing a lot of money out of our pocket on top of all these other costs that people have talked about and time. And one other thing that we're definitely here to advocate for is for, as we spoke of, the direct market sales from our farm. We would love to be able to sell cannabis from our farmer's market and just our products alone. And that is something that we feel is, is something that should be across the board offered to any of these farms that have all this infrastructure already set up. And I thank you guys very much for hearing us today. I'm going to be brief because I know there's some other people that want to speak. But again, I, I can't say more. I grow plants in the ground from seeds. If this is an agriculture, I, I don't know what it is. And that was something also that we haven't defined is yeah. that nobody defined, okay, if it's not agriculture, what is cannabis then? So thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, <laughs> thank you, uh, Jesse. Um, so do we have uh, any other witnesses that, that want to jump in here or they're growing? We have a Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey's. Yeah, oh, there's. Oh, <clears throat> morning, Jeff. Morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I'm remote from Burlington today. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, so I just want to say that uh, I did send along over email uh, some material. Uh, I have some prepared testimony that I'll be reading from. Uh, I'll go through it, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. While I'm reading it, please feel free to stop me at any point. Uh, I just want to recognize uh, the time here, so I'll, I'll try to be quick. But I just want to say um, thank you, everybody, uh, for holding this space. Um, thank you, Chair uh, and committee members, for allowing me to speak. Uh, it is good to see everyone once again. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, welcome back to the State House. Uh, and thank you again for taking up the important issue of cannabis regulation. Um, I also want to say uh, good morning and thank you to my friends and colleagues that spoke uh, before uh, and those that will come after me. Um, for the record, my name is Jeffrey Pizzatello. Uh, I am a longtime uh, legacy cannabis cultivator, uh, indoor regenerative farmer. I'm also the executive director of the Vermont Growers Association. We are the state's cannabis trade association. And though we have growers in our name, we represent the entire supply chain with over 80 members ranging from retailers, growers, manufacturers, labs, to non-plant touching businesses, uh, such as security companies and whatnot. Um, VJ is also the founding member of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. Uh, and we have been in this committee in years past uh, alongside rural Vermont and Nova Vermont and some of my colleagues in that coalition. That coalition includes the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, Green Mountain Patients Alliance, NOFA Vermont, and rural Vermont, respectively. Uh, we like to think that collectively, uh, we represent the local communities most impacted and those with the greatest stake in the adult use and medical markets. Uh, and I will be giving my testimony today as a member uh, of the coalition. Um, we have been in this committee years past, notably with my colleague Graham uh, of Rural Vermont and Maddie uh, Kempner, Policy Director of NOFA Vermont, names you are likely familiar with, uh, discussing the issues central to our communities we represent. Uh, they remain as such. Um, so I've got a list of about nine priorities that I'm going to go through with just uh, speaking briefly to each of them. Uh, those nine priorities remain. Uh, allocating 20% of the cannabis excise tax revenue to reinvestment in communities disproportionately harmed in a community reinvestment fund to be administered by members of those communities. 10% of the cannabis excise tax revenue to the community, I'm sorry, to the cannabis business development fund. Uh, also designating all tiers of outdoor cannabis cultivation as agriculture or a designation with similar benefits as agricultural designation as defined in Act 158 2022, which was talked about last year. Uh, some of those uh, exemptions include local control, uh, as Jesse had spoken to. Um, also, um, lifting the current use criteria that is in statute and including uh, agricultural structures in this designation as well, as John Rogers and others have spoken to. So you're going to hear a lot of overlap. I'm going to be reinforcing a lot of these points. Um, mind you, these are top priorities for the industry. Um, so in addition to the agricultural designation that's been talked about, uh, we also seek uh, reasonable direct market access for small cultivators and manufacturers that includes seeds and living plants. Um, the allowance for cultivators to own their own cannabis products that are principally produced by their own cannabis flower. This is another thing that uh, Mr. Rogers had spoken to. Uh, we are also seeking an increase to home grow allowances, 10 plants, uh, an increase to the manufacturing tier one annual gross cap. Right now it's $10,000, we are seeking an increase to $100,000. And then lastly, to support the medical cannabis policies of our coalition, which were uh, put forth by the Green Mountain Patients Alliance. Uh, I have included all uh, of these priorities, uh, again, to you guys uh, over email, so you should have them uh, available to you either now or after the meeting. Um, so. Last year, we held conversations in multiple committees and with several policymakers, including those in the Cannabis Control Board, about the importance of not advancing the adult use market any further without first allocating funds for community reinvestment and a business development fund to help seed 
assist and support those in need and most impacted by cannabis prohibition and systemic racism. Even though we are in an agriculture committee today, every decision we make in this industry must be weighed with the considerations of the harms caused by prohibition and the individuals and communities most affected by the so-called war on drugs. And this is why we're asking lawmakers to allocate 30% total of the cannabis excise tax to these two different funds. Moving on, every year, BGA surveys the general public, the cannabis industry, and its members through what we call our annual policy survey. And I want to impart on you, and you've heard this uh, earlier today, direct market access remains a top priority for Vermont licensees and prospective licensees. Some form of direct market access for small cultivators, and I want to underscore, and manufacturers is not optional. In fact, we, can, we perceive this to be a missing component of the adult use market structure. Direct to consumer is a pillar of the marketplace. Looking across the country at states with more mature markets, they struggle without this missing component to their market structure. And in some states, uh, they're even beginning to bail out their small producers, something that we see as a theme in other agricultural commodity markets. We're trying to avoid that here in Vermont. As a result, we are asking for on-farm and off-farm direct sales allowances for cultivation tiers, specifically one through two indoor, one, two, three tier of mixed, and one, two, three outdoor. So that is our scale appropriate regulations. Uh, and this is to include allowances for all cultivators to sell uh, products manufactured from uh, their plants uh, via wholesale, and then those with direct market access to directly be able to sell those manufactured products to uh, the general public as well. Um, moving over to manufacturers, uh, we are asking um, for direct sale allowances for manufacturers tier one and two with an annual gross cap of two million of the cannabis products principally produced by that licensee. So that is our scale appropriate uh, approach to the manufacturing license type category, similar to what we did with the cultivation license type category. Um, and again, uh, I went through a lot there. I've included all of these uh, details and our actual language that we have for direct market uh, in, uh, in emails to all of you guys. Uh, moving on from there, uh, in committee last year, we also deliberated, deliberated the agricultural designation of outdoor cannabis cultivation in Bill S-188, which became Act 158. Um, and the conversation last year struck a compromise on limiting those benefits to tier one cultivators and those in current use. So this year we're returning and as was uh, stated earlier today, we are seeking basically to expand those benefits as outlined in 158 to all outdoor tiers of cultivation and the outdoor aspects of mixed category as well. Uh, so keep in mind our mixed cultivation category is part indoor, part outdoor. We are saying the mixed category should not be exempt from this agricultural light designation. And again, this includes exempting local control, as Jesse spoke to, which is very material to not just not just Charlotte, but several localities across the state right now, which I'm happy to dive into in greater detail. Um, in addition to the local control measures, lifting the current use criteria, and again, including agri agricultural structures. Um, not only is this issue of great urgency, urgency for the current and prospective licensees, but this is effectively posing a barrier to entry to many, many farmers that are looking to participate in this market. Uh, and we have actually heard from uh, other state agencies, as some of you may be familiar, not only is the Cannabis Control Board, but I believe also the Tax Department is in support of these initiatives and rounding out uh, this agricultural designation, if only to simplify the tax code to all outdoor tiers of production. Uh, if there's no questions, moving on. Uh, Vermont has some of the lowest plant count allowances for adults to grow in their homes, which is providing uh, which is proving problematic for most Vermonters because most Vermonters that choose to grow in their home grow more than two plants. So it's really about being practical. New York State just enacted six plants for their home grow. Uh, and there is likely to be, if you're not aware, a medical cannabis bill this year that the CCB is likely supporting that. So that is going to allow for um, or seek six mature plants. So we're asking lawmakers to increase the home grow allowance for all adults to 10 mature plants or at least the number that is going to be in the upcoming medical bill. Um, bringing this to a close, um, when the CCB first developed its initial rules, it defined a tier one manufacturer license to be an at-home business. Uh, that includes an annual gross cap of 10,000, as I said earlier. 
Uh, so those that have this tier one manufacturing license cannot bring in more than $10,000. They have an annual gross cap. Uh, at that time, when the board was developing these rules, they couldn't foresee the price gouging that was talked about uh, so eloquently by John Rogers. And I don't use that word loosely. There are wild expenditures associated with starting an adult use business, banking fees, insurance fees, let alone packaging and other regulations that, that these individuals have to jump through. And we have found that the tier one manufacturing license uh, is not practical. And those that currently have it are operating in the red. Many tier one manufacturers right now are projecting 13,000 to 15,000 minimum in just expenditures. And this is the license with a 10,000 gross cap. So we're asking that this gross cap get adjusted to 100,000. And I just wanna note that the CCB is currently uh, undergoing a rules amendment process and they are proposing that this figure get increased to 50,000. Uh, we are uh, through the direct feedback of these manufacturers that we are seeking 100,000. Um, lastly, uh, and just brings to an end, while taking all of these priorities into consideration this year and in discussion today, uh, the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition asks everyone here that we not only weigh your decisions with the consideration of the harms caused by prohibition and the individuals and communities most harmed by the so-called war on drugs and systemic racism, but equally by the understanding and recognition of the medical cannabis community, which is an issue that's often not talked about here in Vermont. Uh, this is a community, the medical cannabis community that has unique interests and challenges intrinsic to the patients and caregivers of that community. A medical cannabis program currently exists in Vermont, but has been largely ignored. And as a result has become dilapidated, losing focus of the interests of those it's intended to serve patients and caregivers. Uh, it included in my email to the entire committee is the policy platform of the Green Mountain Patients Alliance. Though it may not be a primary focus of this conversation today, we wish for you to dig into that and become familiar, if you're not already, with the medical cannabis program and the reforms that we're seeking this year. Uh, that is my uh, prepared testimony. I, again, thank you for your time uh, and happy to answer any questions. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Jeffrey. Are there questions from no, no, very helpful. <laughs> um, we we only have a, a limited time left, and <clears throat> we have uh, James Pepper with us, and uh, it would be good uh, to hear from James. Uh, I you missed some of the testimony, but caught some of the questions or. <clears throat> or concerns that were raised, and and uh, and then I understand you're uh, redoing some of your rules and regs, um, and you know what what you, are you doing uh, to upgrade? And are any of these questions that were raised this morning, and many of them pertain to that list of. 17 things. Um, uh, where, are, are you looking at anything that would address these issues? And I think to, to get started, um, I would ask uh, the question of who determines uh, or who did determine that growing hemp and cannabis wasn't an agricultural product. <laughs> if you know the answer. Yeah, thank, thank you for the uh, kind of lead in there. Uh, for the record, James Pepper from the chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, you know, I, I had a different job when this bill was being debated, but I will say that, um, you know, I, I know that over the course of a number of years, it's been through at least 11 different committees. I know at least four more had um, kind of jurisdictional input that they provided. Um, you know, this is the bill that eventually was the kind of compromise bill was, what was the phrase, the camel is a horse made from committee. This is like the ultimate camel of a bill. Um, and that is one of many things that are in statute um, that create hardships for our small cultivators. And, you know, trying to discern a legislative intent 
from a 102 page bill that's been voted on you know hundreds of times uh, is difficult but but you wrote a legislative intent one time in the bill and you said that uh, it's the intent of the general assembly to shift as much of the illegal cannabis market into a regulated space and to encourage participation by small local farmers and you know a lot of what comes after that counteracts that you know a lot of the the concerns I'm hearing around insurance requirements and, and people do pay, people are charged a premium for cannabis insurance. Um, you know, there's no admitted insurers in the state or I think in any state, I think there's one in California. So these are all surplus line insurers that, you know, can charge essentially whatever they want and exclude whatever they want from their coverage. Um, you know, there's a lot of the, um, there's no banking, there's no lending, there's no lines of credit. Um, and so you know a lot of these people that are getting in um, to this business really need support right now to make sure that they're not in a worse position um, you know if they have to go out of business because they put all their own personal money into this and so I know that this list of 20 um, items I've been through it with uh, our team at the cannabis board I've seen um, the Vermont Growers Association list of legislative asks you know, just given the time, I, I'm not sure that it makes sense for me to go line by line. I can tell you no. that some of them are regulatory and we can fix. Some of them are statutory and we can't fix. And to your original question, I think it was the House that said that growing cannabis is not agriculture. I think there's reasons that they did that, um, you know, as, as compromises. Um, and uh, I can't speak, you know, I was, I was doing a different job at the time. I can't speak to it but i can i'd be happy to kind of walk you through what the consequences might be of kind of changing the designation to agriculture and, and who might you want you might want to hear from um, but um we our job is not to be an advocacy organization but we do have this mission to support small local farmers and it's exacerbated by the fact that if they go out of business you know they're they're in a worse position um, you know, now that they're in, now that, you know, they've gotten off the sidelines and shifted into a regulated market, we need to support them. Well, you know, a few issues, and you mentioned some were, um, you know, not being able to go to a bank. And the credit union will deal with them, but charge them like $1,500 to, to, to the deal. Um, you know, that... Um, and I, I guess I should look in the mirror um, because a lot of these things, you know, if I'd have spent personally as chair of the Senate, I, if I'd have spent more time on maybe on this cannabis growing and, and you know, it wouldn't have happened or maybe nothing would have happened because we would have put up such a, a fight. But we didn't, we didn't really, the Senate Ag didn't really weigh in a great deal on this. It was mostly judiciary and, and other committees. Uh, and uh, I guess we, we should have been maybe paying more attention. Um, it, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, like the question of if they grow inside their little thousand feet and, and uh, that building's happened to be a new style yeah. appraisal, yeah. they get down still. And, you know, little things like that, if it was, if cannabis in some way was, classified, especially the small block, that was classified as ag, that issue wouldn't even be an issue. And so there's little things that, that uh, you know, shouldn't take a lot of effort to fix. I, I would totally agree with that. Um, there's little things that can have a 
a tremendous impact, especially when you think there's no lines of credit. I mean, you know, if you're running short one month and you don't have the ability to get, you know, credit or financing or bank loan, you go out of business. And I, I know that the cessation of operations escrow account, you know, we had a big fear and we didn't, we didn't require it for small cultivators, by the way, and we tiered it based upon the size of your operation. That was to provide people some kind of cushion so that when they're on the verge one month, they can pull from some account and and then replenish it within 30 days. But uh, you know that's one thing that we can do. It's not even in our regulations the amounts we can drop those down through guidance. You know they're in guidance right now. We for all of our regulations that aren't statutory statutorily required we have the ability as the board to have a waiver process. And so what we do is kind of in, you know, some situations, I think with Senator Rogers or, or John Rogers, um, you know, we said, well, what's your plan if you're abruptly going to go out of business? And he provided this a plan and we granted him a waiver um, in order to kind of reduce the initial barrier to entry. No, they didn't. We did not grant you? No, no. I asked okay. for one. They okay. still made me put 2,500 bucks okay. in the calendar. Mm -hmm. Send the mail. Yeah. <laughs> the mail. Yeah, get you. Um, well, um, I think we're gonna uh, have to have you back. Yeah. Pardon? Have you back? Yeah, and you know look, look the list over, James, yeah. and and you know the committee's got has some concerns uh, as well. Um, like we have Vita. There's yep. a farm lending help that, and if if that was if small growers were considered ag, they might be able to get money there. I mean, yep. it's some issues that we've got to look into in the meantime. Um, and uh, if if you put together any sort of a document to talk about. If this is the policy and we're trying to encourage local growers, if you put together a document that um, you could share with people saying, here's the things that we um, think don't match what, what the policy is, or what the outlay statement in the beginning is. You know, if you look through our rules, you gave us the authority, you said, you know, you need to write regulations around environmental impact, uh, regulations around safety, security, environment, you know, uh, public health, warning labels. You need to write all these regulations. You're allowed as the cannabis board to go through line by line and waive any of these regulations for small cultivators, but you can't waive statutory requirements. Right. And so our rules, if you look at our fee waivers, you, I mean, our sorry, not our fee waivers, just our waiver list, you can kind of see all the areas where a statute conflicts with the needs of small. So it'd be better if we had the list that's in the statute yeah. that you yeah. think we could change in a certain direction uh, that would... And, and, and I got to say that the, the list that you have in front of you deals with a, a number of them. I think what I could do also with this list is... Um, could you refine that for us? Just let you know what we can do without, okay. you yeah. know, oh. and, and what, what you would need to do statutorily. And, right. yeah, you know, we don't want to do anything that's going to wreck the program right. either. So, you know, and, and none of us are in that business and and the... I would hope the board would have an understanding, well, if you do this, you know, yeah. it's going to really right. cause an issue over here. Yeah. And, and, uh, so, you know, you know, I, I, the thing that's disturbing to me in hearing, um, the small growers that are local talk about is, They've got banking issues, they've got insurance issues, they've got, you know, if I go to set up a thousand square feet, I'm going to put a hundred thousand dollars into getting ready. And I see the 15,000 out of state, mostly out of state, and, and with the financing that they've got more power. That doesn't sound like the policy of we're trying to encourage the little guy to be the front. Yeah. And, you know, 
sitting here and being part time and not doing your job or, or, or trying to get the business, I need some help to figure out what we should do. Sure. And where should we should con concentrate? Because I'm not real fond of the idea of people with 15,000 square feet coming in and drive my little guys out yeah. and my little people out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> any other questions uh, from the committee? Uh, from James? Thank you. Nice to meet you. Well, yeah. thanks, thank, thanks you for coming in, James. And, and I want to thank all of you uh, participants, uh, growers. Uh, uh, you know, this has been a good uh, discussion, and certainly um, you raised some real important issues that maybe we can do some, uh, and some we won't be able to do, but uh, it, uh, it's good to hear from you and, and know what the major issues are. Yeah, well, we really appreciate the committee taking the time to, to hear us and, and give us an audience. We think this is a real economic development opportunity, and we see ourselves becoming like the craft beer industry, where people are coming to this state. It's going to increase tourism. It's going to increase revenue, and we think we have a real opportunity here. Thank yep, you. So. Thank you. Yep. And please reach out. Use us as a resource. If you want us to come back again, okay. we're, we're the people on the ground. Linda's got all our contact information. Please, if, if you want us to come back, let us know. And I know if you're outdoor growers, you aren't growing much sooner. The so. soil's killing hard today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.